here for other fish if you're here for other fisheries areas uh, on the coast, uh, Willapa Bay or Grace Harbor, we will be having a public meeting tomorrow specifically for Willapa and Grace Harbor. But if you do have questions, we have staff here today that can uh, meet with you either out in the lobby or we have other breakout rooms available uh, to help get your questions answered and take your comments. Next slide. So uh, as I stated, the North of Falcon, what is North of Falcon? It's our annual uh, cooperative process to plan salmon seasons in Washington waters. The name Falcon refers to uh, Oregon's Cape Falcon, which marks the southernmost border of Washington's management of salmon stocks. Uh, this uh, North of Falcon meeting today is part of a larger salmon season setting process that also involves uh, state and tribal governments, uh, federal regulators, other US states and Canada. So as we go through the process each year, we must weigh many different factors when we develop salmon seasons, including uh, Endangered Species Act constraints, Fish and Wildlife Commission policy, Pacific Salmon Treaty obligations, uh, tribal co-management obligations, and then extensive monitoring and evaluation of our fisheries statewide. Folks may or may not know that uh, the North of Falcon process is actually part of a larger rulemaking process for the state under the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, we filed uh, a CR 101, which is an intent to change rules in, in January. We're now in this middle part, uh, in this uh, in-between part, uh, where we have take public comment and draft seasons. Uh, once we come out of the Pacific Salmon uh, Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting in early April, uh, we'll have salmon seasons uh, proposed. We'll file those in a CR 102 filing. We'll take additional public comment and hold a public hearing after that. Uh, we'll make, consider making any modifications to that. Uh, along with that rulemaking will be a concise explanatory statement that talks about how we landed on the rules with, that we did for this year. And once the director signs those, then they are official salmon rules for the year. Really quickly, we're gonna go through the, the ocean quota levels that were developed early in March uh, as part of the Pacific Fishery Management Council process this year in Fresno, California. You'll see that uh, many, uh, the three alternatives uh, have um, high, uh, middle and lower options for Coho and Chinook. You'll see that for Chinook, the options are relatively similar to last year's options. And for coho, we have a much lower abundance, particularly with the Oregon production index that's causing much lower coho, uh, proposed coho quota levels for this year. These are some of the key driver stocks related to ocean fisheries. Uh, Tules are the Chinook stock in the lower Columbia that really drives ocean fisheries. Currently in the high ocean option, we're below that management objective. Uh, Lower Columbia Natural Coho, we're also below that management objective of 23%. The one that's bolded there is the one that we're really keeping an eye on and trying to work uh, with our co-managers and in-river uh, to craft a fisheries package to get below uh, the Quilute River Natural Coho at 39%. Currently, the modeling has us at 42%. This is kind of hard to read on the slide. There was a handout out front. This is where the current Chinook modeling results are for Puget Sound. You'll see that a number of the stocks are bolded in red. I would, I would highlight in particular the, the stocks that we're looking at this year are Nooksack Springs, uh, Skagit Summer Falls, uh, Snohomish uh, Chinook, as well as, um, uh, Sorry, still a Guamish, uh, as it has been in the recent past. For Coho, uh, things are looking relatively similar to last year for Coho. Um, last year, the, the Skagit stock was the constraining stock that's in a higher exploitation uh, category this year. So really, the current modeling uh, with the, all three ocean options, uh, we are uh, above our objective for the Snohomish. Also on the high option, we're above on the Hood Canal objective currently. So just really quickly, uh, tonight uh, in uh, Clarkston, we're going to be having a Northeast of McNary Upper Columbia Snake River meeting. Uh, that'll be from 6 to 8 tonight. Uh, also tomorrow night, as I mentioned, we have a Zoom meeting uh, specifically for Willapa and Grace Harbor Fisheries. 
Uh, following that, we will be in Seattle starting April 6th for the Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting where we will try to wrap up seasons for the year this year. So really high level, that's what we have to start with today. Be happy to entertain any questions or comments related to what we presented so far. Uh, uh, if there are none, we'll, we'll take a quick five minute break and allow people to disperse to breakout meetings. So any questions or comments online or in the audience? And if you have one in the room, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll have somebody come to you. Great. Well, with that, oh, can somebody grab a mic and take it to Shannon? Yeah, good morning. Do you have any um, more information on this uh, Thompson River coho uh, and the uh, Upper Fraser coho as it relates to the impacts on our inside fisheries here in Puget Sound. Could you clarify your question a little bit, Shannon? Is there a specific something you're looking at in terms of the Thompson stock? And Well, um, I haven't had a chance to uh, go through this coho sheet. Well, currently, all the modeling has us below on the Thompson objective so far below meaning we're below our 10 percent cap on on exploitation for the southern u.s fisheries okay so then mo moving uh inside uh, how many uh coho would be allowed to be taken uh in area seven at seven a well i i don't split that with the ocean right yes this includes all the southern u.s fisheries from the ocean on inside uh, both uh, tribal and non-tribal fisheries. That's what's currently in the model that you're seeing on screen. Okay, so then um, lower Frazier, okay, I see it. Um, so then uh, uh, I asked this question every year. So what are we, what are we looking for as far as um, uh, Frazier escapement on cohos this year. Did we have any information on that? And did they meet their escapement goal last year? Thank you. Uh, I don't have any information to that. I might ask if any of, uh, we have some members of the Southern panel related to the Pacific Salmon Treaty that may have further information, but I'm guessing Shannon that the 2023 escapements aren't completed or compiled yet uh, to be able to answer that question specifically. I think the most recent report we had as part of uh, uh, the, the Pacific Salmon Commission meetings was uh, a recap of the 22 season uh, with final modeling and escapement. Thank you, Shannon. I'll jump in for a second, Mark. Um, we had our manager to manager meeting with um, CFO a couple weeks ago, and I got a refresher course on their objectives for Interior Fraser Coho. They're meeting their meeting and exceeding abundance places they thought they would have been. The abundance is really good. The productivity is still really low. The survival from smolt small to adult is still a really low level. So they're still at that critical um, threshold that keeps the southern U.S. fisheries at 10% and keeps Canada's fisheries at a really low level. Abundance is better, but the productivity is not good. They're, they're just not having good survival. So you can't go fish those fish harder or you'll just drive the abundance back up. Any other questions or comments? Great. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to take just a quick five minute break. Uh, folks in the room, I'd encourage you to move towards the front uh, so you can see the screen better and 
uh, be better engaged. Again, the commercial breakouts in room 401. Well, thanks again, everybody, for being here. Uh, again, my name is Mark Baltzell. I'm the statewide salmon and steelhead manager. Before we get started with the rec breakout, I guess I just wanted to do some staff introductions for folks here at the front of the room. Uh, we'll start to my left all the way on the end. We have fish program uh, director Kelly Cunningham. Next to him is Kyle Addix, who's our intergovernmental salmon manager. Uh, next to him is Ty Garber, who's on our uh, modeling team, specifically uh, coho modeling. Uh, next to him is Chad Herring. He's a, a policy analyst with our intergovernmental team. Uh, to my right is Dr. Kirsten Simonson. She's our recreational fisheries lead for Puget Sound. Uh, beside her is Derek Dapp. He's our uh, lead salmon modeler, uh, head of the modeling team. Uh, and next to Derek is Haley Rosenthal. She's a, a recreational support biologist on our team. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn them. I'm not going to go through the public meeting uh, guidelines and etiquette. Hopefully everybody remembered that from 20 minutes ago. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to Kirsten, who's going to run through uh, some of the where we are currently. And then we'll uh, launch into the discussion from there. Uh, so just a quick run through of, of some of the agenda items today. We're going to talk mostly through the recreational considerations for this upcoming year. Uh, we will uh, do a brief recap of the marine recreational season proposals as they currently stand. Um, obviously, there's a long way to go before we have everything completely finalized, but this is kind of the, the current status of, of where we are uh, for both Chinook and Coho seasons. We'll go through some uh, some current freshwater recreational seasons. Um, I do want to point out that we'll kind of do a really high level overview of that of uh, the freshwater seasons um, in this presentation. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so we'll hopefully everybody <laughs> kind of heard what I was saying online. Uh, we'll do a quick overview of the uh, freshwater recreational seasons. Um, I won't go too much into detail on this presentation. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of this information will be available online. Um, if not, if it's not there already, it will be very soon. Um, and we also have a number of regional staff in the room with us today that can answer any specific questions about the freshwater seasons. Um, and then finally, we'll go through some modeling scenarios. Um, Derek has uh, some information to share and a new modeling tool that we can kind of walk through some potential uh, scenarios for this upcoming season. And then obviously the crux of why we're here is to take comments from everybody in the room and everybody online. So. Uh, with that, we can go to the next slide. So uh, for those who have been involved in meetings thus far this year, this slide will not come as much of a shock to everybody, but there's a number of considerations going into the season. Uh, we do have several, several limiting stocks this year, including Nooksack Spring Chinook, Skagit Summer Fall Chinook, Snohomish Chinook, and Snohomish Coho. Um, still Aguamish and, and Snohomish Chinook conservation limits are going to continue to be a driver of recreational opportunities uh, this year, much like they were last year. Uh, we are still trying to always working to maximize our fishing opportunity within the available impacts and conservation constraints that we have within Puget Sound and uh, around the area. We've been spending a lot of time talking about recent year variability and effort trends. Um, it's no surprise that there's been a, a really significant increase in, in the number of people that are spending time on the water in uh, the Puget Sound region. And so kind of taking those numbers of increased effort and uh, being able to carve out seasons has become a bit more difficult when we have, you know, the same number of fish returning, but more people trying to harvest them. Uh, so just something that we've been working on. Um, so we're seeing reduced forecasts for both Puget Sound Chinook and Coho relative to last year. We do have a number of, of environmental concerns that are ongoing. Um, we are in a current El Nino situation. Um, it's not a very, or it's it's been a particularly strong El Nino, but it's not predicted to last for particularly long this time around. Uh, so we're just kind of keeping an eye on what that's going to mean. But generally speaking, El Ninos are not good for returning salmon. Um, we've also been in a, a, this kind of cycle of droughts and floods um, as climate has been changing. Um, and right now we're kind of in a low snowpack situation as well. Um, I think there's predicted to be some snow in the mountains today, but generally it's been a pretty warm winter and spring so far. So we are a lower snowpack than we typically are this time of year. Some other things to point out, the Fraser sockeye forecast is the lowest on record. So that's going to affect some of the, the sockeye for, uh, opportunities for this coming year. Um, chum stocks continue to be in low status. This is something that's been continuing for the last several years. Um, and then finally, there are continued concerns over SRKW. 
So what we're looking at now is kind of a brief overview of the seasons as they currently stand. Um, this might be kind of difficult to read for folks that are in the room. Um, again, this is available online for anybody who wants to go take a deeper dive and, and looking at this. Um, but you'll notice that generally speaking, the seasons are pretty similar to what they looked like last year. And I'll go through some specifics of both the, the Chinook and Coho seasons over the next slide. So if we go to the next slide. So this is the kind of the list, the rundown of the current proposed uh, Chinook seasons for Puget Sound. You'll see that most of these look really similar to what they did last year. Uh, so areas five and six have that July 1 through August 15th opener. Areas seven and nine, we're looking to do short weekend openers in July again. Um, the date that we've picked is kind of uncertain, but uh, we, you know, there's still up for discussion on that, but it'll likely be mid to late July on that one. Um, area 10, looking at a July start again, um, and that will probably coincide with the area seven and nine opening. For area 11, looking at that June season and then the July through September, much like it was last year. Um, area 12 looks really typical for a non-pink year with a July 1 opening south of AOC and an August 1 opening north of AOC. And Area 13 has no changes. And the winter seasons are proposed to be really similar to what they were this past year. So now if we take a look at the uh, current coho slides, our co current coho season proposed, um, what is highlighted here in bold is the are the uh, changes from last year. So in areas five and six, you can see that it's currently in, in the model as a mark selective fishery through uh, the end of September and then non-selective uh, from uh, for that last week of September for with a one coho limit. And then again, that August 1st through 15th time period with a two coho limit. For area seven, uh, we're looking at a mark selective fishery for August with two coho limit and non-selective in September with a one coho limit. For area eight one, uh, that's currently in the model as opening August 1st and going through the kind of the mid-October time period. So it's a little bit of an extension from last year. For area eight two, we currently have it modeled as non-selective from October through the end of September with a two coho limit. So the two coho limit would be an expansion from last year. For area nine, it's currently modeled as mark selective through the end of September and then non-selective for about that last week in September with a one coho limit. Um, for area 10 and 11, uh, mostly those are the same except with an, uh, an additional time in early November, um, that would be non-selective. For area 12, again, this is really typical of a non-pink year and then in area 13, there are no changes. So now if we look at some of the freshwater seasons that are proposed, again, I'm going to kind of go through this so, somewhat quickly um, and kind of a high level. Uh, like I said, there are a number of regional staff that are in this room that could answer any specific questions. So for the Nooksack, we're looking at a similar coho season to last year. Um, there is a proposed chum fishery in the Nooksack. And then uh, just as a reminder, there'll be no sport hatchery spring Chinook fishery due to really low expected returns in the Nooksack this year. For the Samish, um, there are uh, a number of Issues with that fishery in terms of uh, safety of anglers, snagging, crowding, and trespassing. So these are kind of things that are, are being worked on right now and considered uh, going into the season. So if we go to the next slide. So this is a more detailed slide on the Samish proposal. Again, I'm not going to go into really specific details, but there are a number of gear considerations that are being, um, or, or gear restrictions that are being considered for this year um, that will help to kind of alleviate some of those problems that we've seen on the Samish over the last several years. Um, and then you can see the bottom part there, uh, they have the whole area, uh, mouth to hatchery rack would not open for Chinook closed waters through the end of October. And again, um, for anybody who wants more details on this, uh, we can you know, talk through that with the regional bios during the question and answer time period. So we go to the next slide, looking at the Skagit proposed seasons. Uh, the, the spring hatchery Chinook season is uh, similar to last year as of right now. Um, there will be sockeye river and lake opportunity, um, and that's going to start out being a four fish limit in the river and the lake. Um, and the lake is scheduled to open on uh, July 6th, which is, I think, believe that's Saturday right after um, 4th of July weekend. And um, I know Andrew Fowler is on the, on the phone, um, Zoom today, so if anybody has any questions, he will be available uh, for that one as well. Um, and then coho two per day, uh, hatchery or wild, um, and generally the same rules as last year. So moving into Central Sound, um, you can see here the list of, of current proposed seasons for Stillaguamish, Skykomish, Snohomish, Wallace, and uh, the Snoqualmie River is obviously still closed. For Stillaguamish, there will be a coho fishery uh, from late September into October. Um, for the Skykomish River, um, there's currently uh, 
days modeled in for the Chinook and Mark Slocum fishery. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Chinook, uh, the Snohomish Chinook is a big consideration going into this year. Um, so we're going to be really careful about making sure that we're making escapement and um, not exceeding exploitation rates on the uh, Snohomish River Chinook. So just things to consider as we're moving forward. Uh, for the Snohomish River, there will be a coho fishery of September 1st um, and then north of the Forks from in the month of October. And the Wallace River will be open again for coho um, in mid to late October. We go to the next slide. Um, the Seasons for Lake Washington, the Green, Duwamish, uh, Puyallup and Carbon, and Nisqually are all really similar to last year. And then finally here, we're looking at some Hood Canal freshwater fish, uh, fishery options. Um, again, kind of a, a, a quick overview. You can see some of the areas that are closed that listed down there on the bottom. Um, there will be a Big Colcine River proposed fishery um, that's happening again. There are, are regional staff here uh, for anybody who has specific questions uh, related to the Hood Canal fishery proposal. Um, and finally, moving more farther out to the coast, uh, for the Ho River, there will be a lower bag limit than last year. Uh, there are proposed fisheries for this year. Um, you can see these listed up on the screen here. Um, there's a, a mouth to Oxbow on September 16th through, through the mid December. Um, you can see those daily limits there. Um, for uh, Oxbow and Morgan's Crossing, again, uh, mid October to mid December, daily limit two. And then again, those uh, gear restrictions that exist for that river as well. And if we want to move down to the next slide for the Kluyut River, there is proposed fisheries again for 2024. The spring fisheries are looking to be the same as last year. And there's fall fisheries, the potential for a Mark Selective fishery uh, for coho and lower bag limits than in 2023. And if we move to the next slide. So this is some of the current um, feedback that we've heard thus far through North of Falcon. Um, so kind of want to run through some things that we have heard from the public so far uh, and that we are have taking into consideration for this year. Uh, we've heard the desire to add chum opportunity in areas 10 and 11 in October through November. You'll see from the, the current proposed season slides that we do have time built in to um, areas 10 and 11 in that first part of November, which is new from last year. We were uh, we heard um, desire for additional non-selective coho opportunity in um, areas five and six. We've heard desire for to have more quota in area 11 and more fishing days. Um, and, and a two fish limit in that area. We've heard concerns over Samish River Chinook snagging issues. We have heard um, desire to have areas 10 and 11 aligned for summer fisheries in June. We've heard a suggestion to postpone area 10 opening until mid-July for coho. We've heard a desire for more stability for the seasons in areas 10 and 11. We've heard a desire to maintain fresher water fisheries, specifically in areas like the Snohomish River. We've heard um, a desire to have limited um, winter blackmouth fisheries in areas like seven, nine, eight, one, and eight, two. We've heard uh, a suggestion to have an annual limit of Chinook per angler. We've heard uh, suggestions to have more shore fishing opportunity in areas like Marine Area 11. And we've heard a lot of, uh, of comments um, asking to open the Baker Lake sockeye um, after the July 4th weekend. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Derek Depp, who's going to run us through some of the modeling scenarios that we currently have um, up for consideration. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks, Kirsten. As we're getting started up here, uh, the modeling tools are a little different this year than they've been in the past. Um, thanks to some work by Ty Garber. Uh, it's now hosted via a website. So the link to that website, if you'd like to follow along on your own device, is on screen now. If you'd prefer, um, I think that the um, slides for today's meeting are also posted to our North of Falcon public meeting site. So if you prefer, you can access the link through there. I'm going to steal screen sharing in just a moment, but. Hopefully that's coming up now. Um, I do recognize that as we're exploring some of these scenario tools, there can be a lot of uh, writing that's up on the screen. So um, recognizing that for folks in the crowd, it might be hard to see some of these. I'm going to try my very best to kind of walk through what each scenario is and kind of talk through that as we're going through this. But there are plenty of spots in the front. If anybody would like to get a better view, I'll, uh, I'll give this a second before I start up if anybody wants to, to move ahead. Uh, in this scenario tool, once again, um, it's a little bit different than the Excel-based um, than the Excel based tool that we've uh, presented in the past. Um, what we can see is we have radio buttons on the left side where you can choose an action. 
either no change um, or going with one of the actions that's potentially listed for each area in here. You can only choose one action per area. So for example, this model run is built off the high ocean option run for Chinook. And if you wanted to look at what's the effect of uh, low ocean options or middle ocean options, you could click those two boxes there and uh, the results should pop up. We'll talk about how to read those in just a second. So as, as per usual, we're looking at a number of stocks that are um, in this box going across the top in this table. Um, and uh, these are our stocks that Kirsten mentioned uh, might be our constraining ones for the year. So um, still a Guamish is one of the stocks that we have historically um, uh, been a constrainer to some marine sport fisheries. Uh, this year, we're targeting a non-treaty mortalities somewhere between 60 and 65 fish. There's a range there at the moment because as we go through the modeling process, uh, we don't have all of our northern updates in the model yet. And there can be a little bit of wiggle on how that number of available non-treaty mortality shakes out as the process continues. Um, moving our attention to Snohomish, I do think that Snohomish is the stock that I'd really like to focus on in this modeling tool today. Snohomish is the one that I anticipate will be one of our primary constrainers to sport fisheries this year. Uh, we have, um, uh, in discussions with our co-managers, we're looking to be uh, somewhere below a southern U.S. exploitation rate by the end of the process of 8%. Um, and that's because we're in a lower bound, uh, we're below our lower bound threshold, particularly for the Snoqualmie portion of the uh, of the Snohomish stock. So because of that concern this year, we're looking to, at the end of the process, be under 8%. Um, right now, if we look at um, the high ocean option with no changes, we're at uh, a southern U.S. exploitation rate of about 10%. And I think the goal for today's modeling exercise is to try to look at something, uh, changes that we can make to get that more under the range of around 9.5%. As we go through our modeling scenarios, that's what we'd like to try to target is around 9.5% on Snohomish. Uh, that rec rec recognizing that, that probably isn't all the way that we'll need to go by the end of the process, but that's maybe a good place to be um, kind of coming out of this meeting and coming out of today. There are a few other stocks that we're going to really be paying attention to as we're making these changes. We want to make sure that we're paying attention to Nisqually, Skagit Summer Falls, uh, Skokomish, and Nooksack. Uh, as we make our changes, we want to make sure that we're, um, we're uh, uh, are there actions, because all, all these are potentially limiting stocks, are there actions where we could um, uh, simultaneously make decreases for Snohomish or Stilaguamish while benefiting the other stocks? That's something that we'll be looking at as we're going through this tool. Um, one thing I would mention is, um, uh, as I was looking at the tool this morning, uh, there is a small error in uh, the Skokomish category. So as we go through, uh, maybe um, maybe let's not look as much at that one. Um, I think the numbers are coming out slightly wrong as I go through this. Um, I was noticing that, um, for example, as I make changes in the Skokomish River, it does have a small change to Skokomish. Um, I'm not 100% sure why, and I apologize for that error. But um, all the other categories in my testing appear to look good, so um, apologies on that error. Um, so really, um, uh, what we're looking at across the side is, once again, I, I'd kind of talked through uh, the ocean options. We don't know where we're going to land in terms of a high, middle, or low alternative. There is the ability to look at each of those in this tool to kind of get a sense of kind of what those mean in terms of exploitation rates of Puget Sound Chinook stocks. But um, once again, really focusing on Snohomish today, one of the first places that, um, that we've had some discussions around with the public is around kind of what makes sense for Snohomish River. And we have a number of scenarios uh, uh, to look at for Snohomish. What's currently in the modeling is a 26-day uh, season star starting on May 25th. Um, we have different options in here that um, are looking at extensions. For example, a 38-day fishing season or reductions such as a 22-day fishing season starting on June 16th. Um, looking at Skycomish in last year's modeling, which was quite a reduced season, um, you can see the number of unmarked encounters and marked encounters that would be projected under each of these scenarios. Uh, we could look at a situation where the Skycomish was completely closed to Chinook fishing. We could look at Skycomish being at the base scenario, which is, once again, 26 days of fishing, but then look at what kind of the approximate cost of the coho fisheries are in the main stem, so uh, removing those coho fisheries from modeling. Uh, and then finally, there's an option of uh, closure of both the Skykomish to Chinook fishing and the main stem to, uh, to coho fishing as well. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I, I don't know why that's a little blurry up there. Uh, 
maybe we'll give Jeff just a second to take a look at this. Thank you. So there was a question uh, in the room about ocean options or whether things are settled there yet. Um, the answer to that is no. Um, we've had a number of discussions with co-managers since we left the, uh, the PFMC meetings in uh, Fresno in early March. Um, those, the, the final ocean option will come together uh, somewhere early in the process uh, in Seattle starting on the 6th. Uh, I believe uh, there is a, an agenda item for either the 6th or early on the 7th to try to get to one ocean option. Um, but that's a that's an iterative process between uh, the, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel through the Council uh, uh, and, and other states on where we land with those options. So while, while Jeff's working on uh, this, uh, one thing I guess I should mention as we're walking through the modeling scenarios is that Nooksack Springs is a stock that we're going to be looking at this year. Nooksack Springs, particularly for the North Fork component of the stock, uh, is, uh, is forecast to be um, uh, just over 30 fish in terms of its escapement. Um, that's the lowest number that we've seen on record. So uh, for Nooksack Springs, uh, right now our goal, folks might have recognized in the modeling tool that it's listed as to be determined. We're still working out what an appropriate goal might be there. But as we go through the modeling exercises, that's one that we might want to pay particularly close attention to. Carl. Those should be um, in the ocean option section of the scenario. So the ocean treaty troll is uh, in the high ocean option, it's 45,000 fish. In the middle ocean option, it's 40,000 fish. And then in the low ocean option, it's 35,000 fish. And Carl, I think maybe also what you're interested in is currently in the model, the winter treaty troll is modeled at 8,500 right now. So in the final model run last year, the um, the uh, the ocean was at forty five thousand, and then the winter treaty troll was at twenty five hundred. Um, as uh, you're probably thinking about, Carl, uh, that winter treaty troll can have quite a large effect on some of our Puget Sound Chinook stocks, uh, and so that's quite a different number in there that than than there was last year. Oh, Pat. The objective is, though it has not been determined, you said that the objective was to be under 10%. So, um, acknowledging your point, Derek, that it's still to be determined, has not been decided, is the objective likely to be in terms of exploitation rates or in terms of escapement, and escapement for what? Thanks, thanks, Pat. Um, it will be in terms of exploitation rate, most likely. That objective is still to be determined. Uh, if I said 10%, then I misspoke. Um, I don't think that 10% has come up in discussions just yet. We're looking at uh, we're looking at what the appropriate objective is at the moment. 
And I'll just add on that we're always have the goal of making escapement for all of the stocks, right? We always want to be able to, to reach our goals for hatchery escapement, reach our goals for wild escapement. So that's kind of the management objective is what Derek's talking about. I was just kind of speaking more generally that we want to make sure that we have enough returning fish. I, I, the reason why I asked the question is because it gets a little bit confusing to people which one that we are focusing on. We heard that the nor it's the North Fork, right, that has such a low escapement. It's not likely that you'll meet an escapement goal for that stock that's most constraining, right? Yes, that's accurate. And so that's why an exploitation rate is being used, or, or that is probably, I know this is not, there's nothing official, there's no decision, there's still discussions, but it's likely to be in the range of something lower than the 10.3% that's in the management plan, the Puget Sound Chinook Harvest Management Plan, right? Um, it's 10.9% uh, management plan. It was 8.3 for Snohomish, sorry. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's what happened here. So the, the 8.3 for Snohomish, we're looking at in this set of modeling, we're trying to, um, we eventually, by the end of the process, I think we're targeting to be 8% or under. Uh, and then uh, and then for Nooksack, we're looking at, uh, right now our management objective is 10.9%. Um, so we've kind of focused on the North Fork component of the population. Uh, there is an exploitation rate goal for Nooksack in terms of the Pacific Salmon Treaty and through the international process. And so as we're looking at an exploitation rate objective, we're looking at what exploitation rate objective uh, might uh might we need in order to be compliant with the Pacific Salmon Treaty. So there's kind of two different pieces going on there with it. You are exactly right. In terms of escapement, um, uh, we're very far under that escapement goal, and I don't think we can get there with, with fisheries changes. But there is kind of this second piece related to exploitation that, that we need to be looking out for. Thank you, Derek. And, then, and thank you for bringing up the connection to the Pacific Salmon Treaty obligation with respect to the individual stock-based management approach that would apply to this situation that has been sort of discovered recently with the, I guess it's the first time that the three-year moving average uh, calculation of exploitation rates <clears throat> that would be consistent with Nooksack for one, other stocks like Stiligwamish and Snohomish and Skagit also, but the focus is on Nooksack this year because of the Chinook Technical Committee's analysis recently on those three-year average exploitation rates. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so um, when we were originally looking at those uh, CTC results, um, uh, uh, there's kind of two ways that that's evaluated. First of all, we look at what the average uh, exploitation rate was for that stock in southern U.S. fisheries between 2009 and 15. And then we evaluate it with uh, both what was coming out in individual years and what comes out in terms of a three-year average. And when we when, when we looked at Nooksack, we, we did a really hard look at kind of our technical information and our data going into the analysis of that stock. After we'd performed that look, uh, we, we were compliant with the PST uh, when we looked at um, the three-year average between 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, but we were uh, we were kind of uh, only compliant by applying a 10% management buffer zone that's included into the treaty. So that was something that was of concern. When we looked at the individual years, there were also some overages there relative to that 2009 through 15 period. Um, so we're still kind of in the process of, uh, of running our CTC analysis in terms of 2022. Uh, but we are really concerned about what those results might be coming out, given that uh, given that Nooksack was one that kind of got flagged as the PST of being within that 10% management buffer and that we had to do kind of quite a bit of work last year on. So we're kind of um, uh, a big part of why it's still in that TBD category is we're buttoning up all of our data. We're seeing kind of how the analysis when we add an additional year into the series 2022 might look in terms of that CTC analysis. And just making sure that whatever management objectives we, we, we have might be compliant with that Pacific Salmon Treaty. And then one, just to close on that, <clears throat> Derek, and I know it's really technically detailed because of the good work that you're doing with the CTC and others, but this has been called out uh, by National Marine Fisheries Service 
right in their guidance letter for to the Pacific Fishery Management Council uh, as a, and of course it needs to be met the obligation of the treaty before the oceans not just the Puget Sound fisheries <sighs> that uh, are affected but it's in combination the ocean and inside fisheries that need to meet this obligation so there's going to be as I understand it there's going to be more analysis by the CTC before the end of PFMC week in order to make a determination of compliance with the treaty for both inside and outside fisheries. Is that right in general? Well, um, I appreciate the additional kind of context that you provided there. Uh, you, you are correct. In NOAA's guidance letter, they did have a specific kind of paragraph where they outlined that they wanted to make sure that any objectives for this year were compliant with the PST. So that's kind of where Nooksack plays into some of our domestic process, since this is an intersection between the international and domestic. I think um, in terms of, uh, you mentioned that the CTC would have to do an analysis prior to uh, our, the conclusion of our domestic process. I don't think it's CTC necessarily would be doing that. I think it would be a combination of the co-managers working with NOAA to ensure that NOAA was comfortable with what we were proposing there. Um, but it looks like um, uh, maybe now might be a good time to jump back into some of those scenarios since it looks like uh, uh, it's still a little blurry, uh, but it's maybe better than it was, so. But we have a but, hand but with but this one last point on this there's technical issues but there is one way to resolve the obligation under the pst and the case with nooksack and that is to request a variance between the nations and so has the united states I know I'm asking you, Derek, <laughs> uh, maybe Kyle is more appropriate for you. Has the United States requested a variance on the obligation for ISBM compliance with respect to Nooksack? For <laughs> I don't think that we have, uh, Pat. I, I would see if Kyle has any additional uh, comments on this. Um, I, I think that kind of um, we have requested in the past uh, differences for COHO with what we're, what, what's kind of agreed to in the PST with what we might be managing to in a, in a specific year. I don't think we've done that for Chinook. I don't know if either Kyle or Mark have any additional thoughts. So I guess what I would add is I think that's putting the cart before the horses to where we are in the process, Pat. We're still actually trying to look at uh, what the, the, we have some more information that's coming. Uh, 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 there were some uh, additional data points, uh, specifically some odalists that weren't read. Uh, so we're uh, putting things into overtime in the next few days to get those odalists read, uh, update the data set that we use to, to do all this analysis, uh, see where that puts us in terms of our obligations and continue that discussion as we head into PFMC. I, I you know, remember uh, Noah's involved here too. So I think they're really looking at what the co-managers come up with for a plan uh, and what that looks like, and then evaluate uh, if if our fisheries proposals are, are meeting that objective. And then we'll have that conversation with Noah about best pass forward and what we may do just considering what comes out of uh, this updated data in the next number of days. We have a hand on line, if you don't mind, from, from James. Uh, James, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear oh. you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Pat, thanks for your questions. Um, this is... Uh, in the weeds a little bit, but I think you'll ultimately, given the situation this year, pretty pretty important that folks understand, um, you know, uh, where the objective for NICSAC is 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 um, instrumental in setting fisheries this year. So, to answer one of your questions, uh, no, at this point we we have not um, and and are not planning to to institute any sort of request uh, to to Canada for a variance. Um, I think Mark hit the sort of nail on the head there. We're, we're really interested in, in the um, assessment and 
uh, discussions on where the co-managers could get. You know, our objective would be to, to meet the criteria. And I just wanted to also say for folks, um, you know, listening to this and, and maybe, um, you know, following or not following, depending on <laughs> their technical understanding, um, you know, our ability and requirement to meet this objective for, for not just NIPSAC, NIPSAC just happens to be this, the stock this year that's that's um, been pointed out as being over. Um you know, this is to balance off an agreement we have with Canada that they reduced their impact on the tech by 12 and a half percent over that same period. So we uh, we uh, got an agreement with Canada to keep our harvest rates level to the reference years, and they agreed to reduce their harvest rates again by 12 and a half percent relative to those reference years. So it's it, it's ultimately. Uh, important uh, that we meet the obligation because we have a treaty with them, but also uh, to garner those reductions that can then be passed through uh, our waters, um, you know, and, and into the river and ultimately uh, into escapement. Um, so um, happy to answer any other questions, but that's sort of where it stands right now. Thanks. Thanks, James. I, James, I see um, two questions in the room. After these two questions, I'd like to move on from the Nooksack objectives, just so that we can kind of walk through the scenario modeling tool a little bit, and then we can circle back to that after the scenario modeling tool. But for now, let's take uh, these two questions if we can. Thank you. <clears throat> in relation to uh, fish, swimming through Canadian waters, and, and we know that our Chinook, we're talking specifically about Chinook, um, migrate up into the, into the Alaska waters too. Um, we know about the uh, Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea trawl fishery. Um, they're taking a lot of Chinook and their bycatch. That's unacceptable. Um, now talking about Canadian waters, there was an article that just came out couple months ago about the West Coast, Vancouver Island, trawl fishery, um, 32,000 or was it 20,000 Chinook were caught in their bycatch. Um, I know that earlier meeting, Mark, you talked about the fact that yes, you don't have any jurisdiction on that. We have the knowledge of it. So I think with all the big stakeholders, Pacific Salmon Commission, Pacific Salmon Treaty, PFMC, DFO, WDFW, we really have to look hard at that issue because it's affecting salmon, not only returning to Alaskan rivers, Canadian rivers, but also the stocks here in Puget Sound and Columbia River. We can't sweep that under the rug. We shouldn't. It's affecting us. We need to look hard at that and work with all the big stakeholders as well as us here and demanding that the trawl fishery lessen the impact on Chinook stocks. Thank you. So the process that we have to start cutting Yeah, is that better? Okay. Uh, scenarios for us. Instead, get us to where we need to be on these constraining stocks. Okay. 
So thanks, Gabe. I, I think we were on our way there uh, before things got derailed a little bit. So I think Derek's going to jump into the the uh, the modeling tool and some of the scenarios that we've been looking at for seasons. Yeah, appreciate that, Gabe. Um, so um, as we're looking at uh, different different modeling scenarios, uh, out of our four of our constraining stocks this year, still Aguamish, Snohomish, Skagit, and uh, Nooksack, they do tend to be impacted by a similar set of fisheries when we look across our recreational fisheries. Um, so once again, uh, we're going to focus on Snohomish today. But as we look at what those fishery changes are, let's just make sure that we're looking at what's happening to Nooksack and still Guamish and the other stocks in here. Um, I actually wanted to start, um, uh, once again, most of these scenarios are directed at Snohomish, but I wanted to start somewhere um, where um, uh, it was more directed at Nooksack. Uh, in Nooksack, uh, the place with our largest impacts is uh, Marine Area 5 in the winter. So um, as we look at what changes we might need to make for Nooksack later in the process, um, here's a range of different scenarios. Right now, our quota in Marine Area 5 in the winter is 1,400. And we can look at different options of, uh, of reducing that quota uh, if we need to for Nooksack objectives. So here's a, just looking at kind of a few number changes from 1,400 to 1,000, 1,400 to 700 or uh, closed. Um, you can see kind of the impact that each one of these would have on Nooksack. If we look at it completely closed, you can see the value on Nooksack is 0.2%. Uh, so relatively low, um, but it is kind of, uh, it is once again, one of our higher impacting areas. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's kind of a similar distribution um, in a lot of fisheries for Snohomish and Stillaguamish um, and uh, to Skagit as well. Uh, over here, we can see if we wanted to look at what this change does, um, we can see that it reduces Snohomish exploitation rates by a little bit over 0.1 and uh, still a Guamish by five uh, non-treaty mortalities. As we move through the tool, something else that's important to keep track of is looking at kind of what the, the change to marine catches. So you can look at the in individual action over here on the far right. You can see that because this is changing the quota from 1,400 to zero, that would be a reduction of, of catch of 1,400. And as we're going through the modeling tool, um, it'll keep track of the changes that we're making kind of in this section right here. And in the estimate section above, you can see kind of the resulting, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of the resulting exploitation rates or mortalities or sport catch that comes from taking that set of actions that we're looking at. So uh, that, that's kind of um, uh, Marine Area 5 winter as an option. Um, Focusing a little bit more on Snohomish, uh, we see most Snohomish impacts, the areas with the highest impact on Snohomish are Marine Area 5 in the summer, Marine Area 9 in the summer, and then Marine Area 10 in the summer. Marine Area 7 also has uh, some impacts too, but that would be kind of the next one down the list. So a lot of the scenarios that we've built are really looking at Marine Area 5, 9, and 10. Um, and so maybe starting with Marine Area 5, the area with uh, the most impacts on, on um, Snohomish, um, it would be, um, we could look at um, a change to the summer quota going back to last year's quota. When we updated our modeling uh, for this year, we did see that um, to run the season that we had last year and given the abundances that we have of this year, uh, we did see to run last year's season rather than being 3,900 it would be something more in the range of 4,200 is what the model would predict. We have, um, if we wanted to look at kind of a change that was uh, a little larger, we have a few options in here in terms of reducing that quota to 3,000 or 2,500. We also um, have an option in here where it's uh, shifting the Marine Area 5 summer fishery, retaining the exact same quota, but shifting it rather than starting July 1st to August 1st and going from August 1st to September 15th. Uh, the benefit to that potentially would be that um, you could keep the same quota, but it would reduce the need for um, modeling coho non-retention impacts. So there are kind of uh, different options we have here for Marine Area 5. I'm going to actually scroll down a little bit because there was one other thing I wanted to mention for Marine Area 5. Uh, right now, our Area 5 uh, summer non-retention impacts are uh, quite high. It's uh, 18,000 encounters. And the way that we model that is we look at what the abundances we have of this year are versus kind of um, non-retention that we've non-retention that we've seen in the last three years in coho fisheries. Uh, there was one year that was really sticking out as kind of far above the others. So um, when we were taking a conservative approach to try to look at what types of how many encounters we would need in that very high year, 
uh, I think that maybe that's a, uh, maybe there could be merit to just taking an average of the two highest years in terms of those non-retention encounters. So if we did that, it would shift our non-retention encounters from around 18,000 fish um, in Marine Area 5 in the coho fishery to around, uh, to around 12,800. That's another potential option we could look at. Um, I do think that that 12,800 is still relatively conservative, um, but, um, but the, the thing there is um, we do wanna make sure that we aren't underestimating on our non-retention impacts as we're going through the modeling. We are held in the postseason to pieces like the Stillaguamish payback. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're uh, this is an area that does affect Stillaguamish. So we want to make sure that we're not uh, uh, under modeling in the preseason what we could see as non retention encounters, which, once again, I don't think this would be, but that's an option. Maybe moving into Marine Area 9, uh, looking at something similar. Um, once again, as we updated the modeling for this year, uh, we saw that for the eight day season that we had last year in Marine Area 9, for the abundances that we have this year, the model would predict that we would need around 5,600 fish. Last year's quota was 4,300. So uh, we could look at an option where we change back to last year's quota. Uh, there's another, a few other options I have in here, looking at the quota from 2022, which was 4,700. Uh, 5,600, if you look at the last recent five years, it's not out of the range of um, the quotas that we've had in the preseason. So there's a few different options here. If we wanted to look at a more, uh, a larger change, perhaps if we're trying to squeeze in more in-river fisheries or less reductions in other areas, there's another option here that we're looking at, which is around 3,700, which would be a reduction to last year's quota. Uh, Marine Area 10 Summer, I put fewer options here. This is one that um, when we did the modeling this year, we used the same quota as last year. If folks remember when we got near the end of the process for Marine Area 10 in the summer, we did take a reduction for Snohomish last year, year near the end of the process. Um, and, and so this is already a quota that's a, a little reduced relative to what we might have seen in recent, recent pre-seasons. Um, regardless, because it is one of the areas that has uh, a higher impact on Snohomish, we did look at two scenarios, reducing it by about 500 fish or by about 1,000 fish. So that's an option that we have on the table here. I spoke a little bit to this uh, area five, Marine Area 5 non-retention option. Uh, I won't go into that too much further since I think that we already discussed that. Uh, Marine Area 7 would be kind of the next largest fishery that impacts Snohomish. Marine Area 7 is one that um, I think uh, has really seen a reduction in its season in the past recent years. Um, so uh, I really only have one option in here, which is looking at the quota from 2022, which was 1,800 fish, rather than what's modeled currently, which is around 2,200 fish. Um, relatively small change, but it's something that we could look at to get an understanding of kind of uh, how changes in that fishery potentially affect our stocks of concern. Those are kind of the main scenarios that um, we've looked at in relation to Snohomish. Um, I heard Gabe earlier, um, I, I will put kind of a, a range of scenarios that gets us to where we'd like to be coming out of this meeting on screen in a second. But before going into that, there were kind of, a, we've had a series of public meetings recently, and there were some different options I think that we heard from the public that I just wanted to kind of explore a little bit in the tool and show people how those modeled out. Um, one of those was, um, I think we'd heard interest in potentially um, uh, looking at a larger quota in Marine Area 11 in June. Um, and if folks remember last year, we, um, we only had an eight day season for a planned 30 day season there. So this is an area where, um, where we could potentially um, uh, really benefit from uh, uh, having a larger catch to meet that realized season. Uh, area 11 in June is kind of an interesting one because it's primarily been constrained by two stocks in recent years, which are still Aguamish and, and Nisqually. Um, I think that as we're making changes for Snohomish, we're going to see those Nisqually and Stillaguamish uh, exploitation rates come down a little bit. Um, and so this might be one, given that it doesn't really have impacts on Nooksack Springs, it doesn't have impacts on Snohomish and, uh, and on Skagit. So I, I think this might be one actually where uh, as we make some of those changes that benefit Snohomish, uh, there might actually be room uh, in, in Marine Area 11 in June to take a look at uh, increasing that quota just a little bit. Um, maybe moving down the list, um, I think, um, and I'm not sure if they're online today, but I, I can't remember if it was Kyle or Zachary in one of our last meetings was asking a question of, um, we had taken a measure this year to um, uh, kind of uh, buffer the sublegal to legal ratio in Marine Area 11 in the summertime. Why don't we look at the same thing for Marine Area 10? 
And at the time when uh, I talked through that, I, I had taken a look at that suggestion from the public. But uh, when I did so, here's the problem with that. When we run that scenario, uh, it really increases the exploitation rate on Snohomish. Once again, Marine Area 10 in the summertime happens to be one of those areas where we tend to catch those Snohomish fish. And so uh, it doesn't look to me like from the modeling that that would be uh, a feasible option, unfortunately. Lastly, I think I heard uh, interest, um, I think it was from Gabe, um, in, um, uh, well, what would changes to Marine Area 10 and 11 in the winter look like? Uh, how could that potentially affect things? And so I, I looked at a scenario where we uh, uh, kind of doubled the quotas there just to see the effect it could have. And while it has a relatively small uh, impact on a lot of our stocks, uh, the one thing in particular that I was noticing is that it does have Snohomish impacts as we're making reductions in a lot of our other marine areas that, that could potentially be, or, or freshwater, could potentially be painful to try to meet that Snohomish objective. I, I, I don't think that the kind of the, the right approach would be necessarily increasing those winter fisheries, which could then have an increase on that Snohomish impact. So once again, wanted to walk through kind of some of those scenarios that we've heard in some of our recent public meetings from folks and, and just show you kind of what they look like explored in the modeling. Um, I, I do think that there could potentially be merit um, to um, exploring this marine area 11 in June option, but these other ones I think um, uh, do have impacts on Snohomish and therefore I, I, I might recommend staying away from. Um, I want to, um, uh, I do want to kind of, as Gabe suggested, kind of put some scenario ideas, some things that we've been looking at on the screen at the department that could help us to get to, once again, our goal for today is getting to a Snohomish Southern U.S. exploitation rate that's around 9.5%. But before I do that, I just want to make sure if, um, if anybody has any questions about the scenarios as they're on the board, I think I see Pat's hand starting to raise. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, maybe now is a good time just to check in and make sure it all makes sense with what we've got on screen. Did you have something? <laughs> um, I, I think the, this is really good stuff, Derek. I, I love it, but I, I'm not sure that I'm following and I'm up here and toward the front and I, and I'm more familiar with this stuff, I think, than on a number of people here. So it's really hard to, to follow, but I appreciate what you're trying to do here. And so I'm, I'm just trying to let the department know that this is very difficult for us to engage on. Um, I suggest, this is all, I wish it were different, and sorry about that, but that this whole list of things that are on here would have been reviewed by the advisory group with the department, with you, Derek, especially, and bring it up and, and develop it and really cover it well and make sure that we understand. It is tough to follow. So just that's just, a, that's without getting any, any specifics, that's just my perspective from history and I don't know what you do about that, but take it for what it's worth. I, I appreciate that, Pat. And um, if there are any suggestions on how we could simplify this, I, I think that would be great. Uh, this was an option when we tried to do it in this way, rather than putting X's in boxes and potentially putting X's in multiple areas. We, we are thinking about ideas to simplify it. It still is very complex. Uh, so maybe before we walk through the scenarios, I'll just boil down kind of some of the, the primary talking points here. On, uh, on, on kind of presenting to the advisors beforehand, I think that's a great suggestion, but the problem that, uh, that, that we might run into is that the timelines are just so tight on, on, on some of this. We get the modeling, and uh, I was working on this until 10 o'clock last night, and I still apparently made some errors in how Skokomish is portrayed. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it, it can get really tight with the timelines and having extra time to review. Um, that said, um, as we go through uh, the modeling today, um, this is all publicly available for folks to look at. Uh, in the past, what I have noticed is folks will send me emails afterwards and say, hey, here's a set of scenarios I run, I've run. Does this make sense with kind of what we're trying to achieve? And, and so uh, uh, bear, bear, bear with me. We'll, we'll try to talk through kind of each of these pieces. Um, I, know, I know it's complex, um, but, um, but if kind of afterwards, if folks have either questions for me about the tool or if they have different um, things that they've looked at and run, I, I would 
very much welcome the opportunity to kind of chat with folks on that. I really want to hear what folks are thinking in terms of uh, what makes sense for this year. Carl, did I, did I see a hand raised? Yeah, so many questions. I'll, I'll, I'll limit it to two. Uh, first, a statement I saw in the bullet point, somebody uh, recommended a, a coho delay in 10 to mid-July. I absolutely cannot support that, but we, we can talk about that when we get to coho. Um, and just two questions consolidated here. Um, it, you know, how much of these conservation objection uh, objective challenges are a result of abundance changes over last years. I know that we have a low Nisqually number. That's definitely a big change. And how much is a result of additional harvest proposal inputs in the model by tribes, sport, and or by commercial? My first question. Uh, the second one is, you know, the Nooksack in River, you know, while I, I really appreciate the need for this exercise because we are fishing on, you know, all of the stocks in Puget Sound mixed stock fisheries, um, is there another way, any other way to make a deal on Nooksack? Nooksack because I see, you know, uh, the in-river fishery as the way to solve the problem. I don't see, you know, reducing a fishery in the straits by a thousand fish to save one salmon steak. You know, I mean, literally a tenth of a fish or something by by reducing your fishery by a thousand fish. To, it 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 seems like a a, a shift of harvest to me. I mean, it, it seems like you're you're throwing away a thousand fish to save not even one fish. So I, I, I'm sure you guys have thought of this, but, you know, is there ever a way to, you know, find something else that the nooksacks want, like closing something in the river for a certain period of time, uh, giving them a different time step in the river to fish for or something else that, that they want in the river to, you know, to get them to reduce their in-river fishery? Just a thought. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. So maybe I'll start where where, where you started. Uh, what's 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 driving this? Um, it probably varies a little bit stock by stock. Uh, when we're looking at Snohomish in this tool, um, I it, it is driven this year by abundance changes. We have a lower objective that's related to being below that lower bound threshold on the Snoqualmie population. Um, there are uh, there are changes that we saw to the harvest inputs. Uh, uh, as we're going through this modeling exercise, Snohomish is one that we're really focusing on today because uh, there's uh, overall a larger non-treaty impact on the exploitation rate than a treaty one. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the things that we're considering as we're moving through this process. Um, on, on, on Nooksack, um, we're uh, in such a strange place right now. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's rare that we're at this point and we don't have the management objectives determined, but it is really critical that we look at that, uh, uh, the data that's going into the PST analysis. Um, and so um, it's just really hard to say right now what changes could happen there because it could range from being at a 10.9% objective, um, depending on how that data shakes out, to something to something that's lower. And uh, until we have a great sense of where that is, uh, I, I would uh, I would keep Nooksack in the back of our minds as we're going through the exercise, but I would focus more on Snohomish at the moment. And we have a hand online, Derek. Uh, Kyle, Kyle, go ahead. Cool. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, Derek, for putting all these scenarios together for us to, to look at in this tool. Um, quick comment. I'm pretty confident the July, mid-July Marine Area 10 opener suggestion from the public uh, that was mentioned earlier was actually mid-June. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that was just transcribed, mistranscribed earlier. Um, I don't remember hearing a mid-July from anyone, but I did hear the mid-June suggestion. Uh, quick question on uh, on the Marine Area 9 quota that you're modeling there. Um, it looks like, I just I just want to understand the, um, for the same eight day season that we had last year, um, looks like around 25% more quota would be needed for that season. And it seems kind of counterintuitive since I think earlier we said like forecasts are slightly lower 2024 relative to 2023. I'm wondering if you could just, um, that's some of the bigger jumps. I'm wondering if you could explain that a little bit for us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. So um, uh, on Marine Area 9, um, 
the way that we model that one is we look at uh, a regression. So what we do is we take what the run size is in Puget Sound uh, versus uh, uh, versus the catch per day uh, needed in Marine Area 9. And we run a regression that's based off the abundance there. So that regression produces kind of uh, in recent history what we would have needed in terms of, uh, of a catch per day and then uh, multiplying that catch per day by the number of days open. Um, looking at the abundance, it looks like on average what, we, what, what, what would we have needed. So uh, Marine Area 9 uh, is an interesting one because uh, last year uh, in that regression for an eight-day season, 4,300 was a few, fewer fish than we, would have ex uh, than, than, uh, than we would have expected to be needed for that, that eight-day season. It, the, the difference is, is that we're looking at a recent year average versus just a single year when we look at that one, that, that one option right there. Would, I mean, would I understand that as, as high participation uh, leads to that higher number and, and or more effective participation, more fish caught? What, what's kind of the high level way to understand that? There's a little bit of, uh, th there can be a little bit of uh, 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 variation on, on either end of that regression. Um, that um, uh, uh, it, it could be related to higher higher or lower participation, um, or uh, there, there's probably other factors too: angler success, angler efficiency. Uh, when you have a certain number of days open in the season, maybe uh, maybe even though there's a, a stronger return to Puget Sound, maybe they're just not in that area in that in in one of those days that you're open. So there's a lot of potential factors that could affect that. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe uh, as we move into the scenario tool, uh, Pat mentioned kind of the complexity uh, of what we're looking at here. Once again, uh, what I would really focus on as we move through modeling scenarios is to try to look at a, a suite of changes that gets us to around 9.5% on the Snohomish exploitation rate. Once again, recognizing that with no changes, we're about 10%. And uh, the primary areas that affect Snohomish are uh, in river, Marine Area 5 in the summer, Marine Area 10 in the summer, and Marine Area 9 in the summer, kind of in that, uh, in that ordering. So as we look at scenarios, uh, and we're trying to get to that 9.5% objective, those are kind of the four primary areas that we could look at. There are, there are other places where we could be considering and thinking about. For example, if we think that a change for Nooksack might be necessary, we could look at Marine Area 5 in the winter, include a scenario there, and look at how that affects Snohomish and that might result in a smaller reduction in other places. Or um, uh, likewise, we could look at places like Marine Area 7 that aren't at the top of the list, but could potentially benefit other stocks. So as we're moving through this modeling tool, maybe a good place to start would be talking through a scenario that gets us to that 9.5% and what that could potentially look like. I, I do see a hand raised in the back of the room before I start up. It was before the fish showed up, and um, there is a exploitation rate that is extremely high in July, um, and the modeling gives us 26 days this year. I'd like to propose a season that doesn't impact the steelhead kelts in late May and early June. I'd like a season that started about the 8th of June and went through the 30th of June and not anything into July, because the high impacts are in July when the majority of the wild fish come in. Um, and also the coho fishery, um, a delay in the coho fishery would reduce the impact greatly for everybody, uh, the saltwater guys. Um, the coho fishery, if we delayed that into late September, we could take some of that impact out of the Chinook uh, run there on the wild run. Um, just a couple of suggestions that I'd like to go on the record. Thank you for that. And so I have an option here that's starting uh, at June uh, 16th, but it does extend a little bit longer than you suggested. It goes into July. That's something that we can uh, that we can take back and take a look at and see how that might shake out in terms of exploitation rate. On, on the wild run, if you start getting into July, you're because I'm on the water every day, I see when the wild fish show up. 
there's virtually none in June, but July they start streaming right in. Uh, if you go into July, you're going to be hurting everybody's impact. The saltwater guys and cutting our days in the future, we'd like to see it all in June. Thanks for that. Derek, we have another hand online. Quick, uh, Gordon, go ahead. Hello. Do you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. Great. Um, my question is, forgive me for my skepticism, but you've talked about sublegals, and that seemed to impact Marine Area 10 and the closure uh, this summer. Um, the same day that, or the same week that Area 10 was closed, Seattle Times ran a report that the tribes went into Elliott Bay and in one evening netted over 4,000 fish. At the same time, the, the pier at Alki pulled in 40 fish in one day, large kings. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a, there's a, some can, I don't know, there's sublegals. The, the modeling for sublegals can be inaccurate. At, that week I went down to the locks and saw the locks completely filled with kings moving through. I sent a letter to WDFW for an explanation and they came back and said, that there's the possibility of recycling where those fish actually go into Lake Washington and go back into the sound. Something I've never heard of. Do you care to comment on that? Well, first of all, I would say that the Elliott Bay fishery is, uh, uh, a, you know, it doesn't act the same as the uh, general area 10 fishery. Um, we have a, a, um, a pretty tightly held monitoring program with the Muckleshoot tribe where we have our sampling staff uh, sampling their fishery right alongside their staff. So we have a pretty good idea of, of what, the, what the composition is in that fishery. We do lots of biological sampling on, on that catch and, and what's uh, landed in that fishery. Um, you know, uh, your your point is well taken, and we've we've admitted uh, in a number of meetings that um, the ability to predict sublegal abundance at any point uh, within Puget Sound waters is hard. Uh, it, it's not an easy thing. Otherwise, we would have done it a long time ago. Uh, it's also not well uh, predicted in the model, um, but we 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 do the best we can, and we try to we to get within. Uh, you know, uh, acceptable levels of precision to the best of our ability, given the data uh, that we have available to us. Uh, as far as uh, fish cycling in and out of the locks uh, in into Lake Washington, uh, I think what we've seen, especially in recent years with uh, uh, higher temperatures, is that uh, fish are behaving much differently than they have uh, uh, in that area. Uh, and, you know, I think there's still a lot to learn and figure out as we're looking at what happens in and around the locks and how those fish are entering and leaving the lake. Uh, we have a number of ongoing uh, projects uh, jointly with the co-managers right now to do uh, a lot of assessments for Lake Washington around uh, predators and predator removal and uh, movement of fish uh, within the lake and in and out of the lake. So hopefully as we move forward, collect some more information, we'll be better have a, a better handle on how all those things are interacting together. Okay, just one more question. Has there been a change to how your modeling uh, assesses the opening and closure of Marine Area 10 in mid-season? Or will we see the same model for 2024, uh, 2024? So, uh just to clarify your question, are you referring to in-season management triggers that that uh, open or close fisheries? Uh, yes. So uh, those are still being uh, uh, talked about. We actually haven't had any of those conversations with co-managers. I might point you to some earlier meetings and information on the website 
where the department has actually uh, uh, proposed a different way of potentially managing uh, both areas 10 and 11 this, fish, this year, um, using some uh, monitoring data to evaluate when those uh, legal sized adults are in the area and when might be the best time to, to open the fishery to avoid high impacts on sublegals. So uh, just invite you to take a look at that. Uh, the information's out there. And, um, you know, I think the broad message there is we're, we're always considering different ways that we might manage. Um, you know, a suggestion was made within the last couple of years that we're, we're still considering and having discussions on around managing to a, a total mortality um, index in a lot of these fisheries. So uh, just because those are the management objectives that have been in place doesn't necessarily mean that you know, those will uh, continue forward. I might also add to that though, uh, we do have obligations under the, the Chinook Harvest Management Plan that's being evaluated where we have strict limits on, on uh, you know, what our impact is. Uh, and we don't wanna find ourselves in a scenario where we're having to pay fish back in the future uh, because we overshot our targets on our fisheries. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If I if I could also mark um and and just for folks who might not have been in uh, uh, some of the recent public meetings um for area ten uh, we haven't made any changes but we are trying to look at uh, inventive solutions for how we might deal with um, uh, the sublegal to legals and the variability of that parameter so uh, in marine area eleven for for folks who might not be aware this year rather than using a six year average to represent what those sublegal impacts might be. We're using kind of the highest value of those six years in Marine Area 11 in the summer, where there's a where there's a trigger. So that um, that that might give us a little bit more wiggle room in the modeling when we look at that uh, when we look at that sublegal category, particularly for Marine Area 11. So as I've been looking at um, uh, as I've been looking at 9.5 percent for Snohomish and where we're at currently in the 10 percent and looking at different options on what could help us to get there. Um, uh, I've been looking at, uh, first of all, the first place where I might go is, uh, I really do think that the non-retention in Marine Area 5 uh, is, is looking higher than I would expect it to be. I think a relatively conservative estimate is getting to this 12,800 uh, 12, encounters. Once again, that's the average of the uh, uh, highest two recent years. Um, as I look kind of at the other potential changes, uh, this is a quota reduction in Marine Area 5 of 300 fish. Uh, I, I know that's that's painful to the folks out there. And I, I know that if we're looking at kind of what we think we might need in the modeling, it's around 4,200 fish. But if we revert back to last year's quota of 3,900, um, I believe uh, they did have a full season there and it was about around 3,500 fish is what they caught. So so, so that's, that's a change that, that, that might make a little bit of sense. Um, as we're kind of going through um, uh, these other areas, um, Marine Area 9 as well is one where we see kind of an increase in uh, what we have modeled a little bit relative to what we had last year. Once again, that's based off what we think we might need to have that exact same season. So if we make a change here um, around to what we were last year, and then uh, looking in river, um, this is where it gets tricky. Um, uh, if we look at kind of a reduction to where we're at right now, um, but not quite where we were last year, that gets us a little bit above 9.5%. And then we could look at a few different options to, to get to that 9.5%. Um, uh, we could kind of look at one of the other areas, um, making perhaps a slightly larger reduction, or we could go to the Skykomish fishery as it was last year. That would get us just about there. There's a few different options, but I think starting with something like this as a base uh, makes sense to me, unless as we look through the scenario tool, unless folks think there's another set of options that makes more sense to them. So. Uh, and once again, just to keep track, here's kind of the changes that we made to get to that 9.5%. You could see additionally what impact that that might have on the other stocks of concern, uh, namely still Aguamish or Nooksack or Skagit relatively small changes for those for, for some of those stocks but it is a decrease um, and it is uh, uh, it, it is helping us to get to those objectives uh, even if only a small amount mm -hmm. 
we, we could look at that, but the reason why I chose to look at these other areas rather than 10 um, is because uh, 10, all of these areas, when we look at last year's quota, which is what we're looking at now, marine area five and nine, when we're looking at last year's quota, that had already taken a reduction for Snohomish near the end of the process last year. 10 is one where I didn't make any changes as we were going into the modeling this year for the quota. And the 10 is in the same boat. 10 took a hit last year, kind of near the end of the process. So um, if we, uh, any, any change that we make to 10 is then uh, in the summertime, it's something that we can look at, but it's something that's then a larger change from what we saw last year, whereas this is kind of putting green area five and nine to uh, once again, a reduced season, but about where they were last year. Uh, if we were to look at that, say if we were to look at a quota reduction of about 500 fish in marine area 10, uh, here's kind of what that would look like on screen now, uh, Tom. So it would, it would also get us to about that 9.5%. Hey, Derek, we do have a question online from Stanley. Stanley, go ahead. Okay, you got me? So yeah. why, why, aren't, why, why aren't you looking at marine area six for reductions? There's no scenario you're looking at. I mean, do they like go through five and then go to Canada and then come back down and bypass marine area six? <clears throat> marine area six is a really interesting one in the in the summertime because uh there are impacts on snohomish in marine area six but they're much lower than the other areas it's kind of a similar effect we actually see with still we see the same thing uh and with uh with some of our other stocks that are encountered in uh throughout the straits in marine area nine uh i think in marine area six what we see is we we see a, a really high contribution particularly from the hood canal stocks and that might be due to its location. I'm not sure if that's due to where the fishing pressure is concentrated, but uh, but Area Six uh, has a much uh, a much greater contribution from Hood Canal than 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 Marine Area Five or even Marine Area Nine. Well, my I guess Marine Area Six, if you look at quotas, has the highest quota of any of our marine areas, but we continue to take away from the lower quotas. <laughs> So Stanley, I'm just pulling open a model run now. Uh, maybe we'll take the next question and I'll circle back to that in just a second. I just right. want to check for impact in marine area sixes in terms of Snohomish. Thank you. So, yeah, I just had a question. Um, in the past, you know, we've run scenarios like this where uh, we were sharing the burden of conservation with the co-managers and, and we made up a portion of, of the burden and they made up a portion. Did they already make up some of this or um, are we expected to make up all of the, uh, fill me in, please. It's always really, it's always really challenging uh, to um, uh, uh, think about kind of uh, what moves need to be made. I think that there are, there, uh, the co-managers are considering moves for certain stocks, particularly looking at Stillaguamish, Nooksack, and others that could have an incidental benefit on Snohomish. And to get back to Stanley's question, um, this is, this is kind of what, what we see in the modeling is that the exploitation rate in all of marine area six in the summertime on, on Snohomish is, is only 0.1%. So we get very little, uh, based off kind of what we see in the coded wire tags, once again, being really weighted toward those hood canal fish in the summertime, we, uh, we, we don't really see much of a, a benefit to Snohomish in, in, in reducing that fishery. Pat here. Um, if this stuff, <laughs> if you dig too deep, you know, um, you're going to find some oddities with the modeling. And uh, this area six one is 
uh, I guess you could look at it as let's take advantage of it. Let's have more fishing in area six because there's hardly any impacts for very low for Stillaguamish, very low for Nooksack, very low uh, for Skycomish. So um, let's not, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay, for six. Uh, so it, it ends up looking unfair, but this is one of the problems with the model that we have. And it probably goes all the way back to, to the sampling levels that we had in the base period. And I, my guess is that the sampling in area six just wasn't as high as it was in some other areas. You can get just a few coated wire tags in a base period for a particular stock, make a world of difference when, especially when compared to the base period, which, you know, maybe it was 10 years ago, to now the fishery has grown. So all of the, the little quirks in those tag data elements that drive the model are exaggerated. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, and I guess I'm speaking to the audience here more than I'm not, I'm looking at you, Derek, but I'm speaking back here. There's nothing you can do with these oddities right now other than take advantage of them by being efficient. So that's what Derek is proposing here. He's got up these elements, and I very much appreciate you refining the list here, which anybody can do online, but these are helpful. It identifies the highest impact areas, and I especially appreciate the marine, marine area five suggestion by the department that to work on the uh, sublegal, uh, excuse me, the encounter re non-retention impact reduction. There, that's what it is. It ought to be the NRIR, right? But that one is good because it doesn't really affect the fishery outcome. And that is really important for the sport fishery in Puget Sound is stability. Finding a combination of the highest impact, bang for buck, and the least effect in real terms, like stability of our sport fisheries, which is one of the highest objectives. Stability from year to year, stability from area to area, a balance so that it doesn't affect one area and knock out a fishery completely. And so uh, that's just my little pitch, kind of a support for the modeling tool. Use it judiciously. There are a lot of problems, and that's why Derek's employment until he's like about 72 is secure. We have a couple questions online. Uh, Teresa, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first off, I would second a, a big thank you to everyone for trying to make a, a longer Snohomish River Skycomish season work this year. I really appreciate the combined efforts happening here. One thing I was curious in the data that we have at our fingertips, is there a way to look at or possibly explore with this proposal uh, a Lewis Street down closure? I remember at the beginning of the meeting that you had called out that one of the particular fisheries we were worried about was the Snoqualmie Wild Chinook. And that might be something interesting to look at with uh, the modeling that we have in front of us today. Just checking, do we have uh, Pete Verhey online? Uh, I'm not too, oh, Pete, um, maybe if we could get a mic to Pete if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, hello, Pete Verhey here, Homish uh, District Bio. Uh, that's something to consider. Uh, closure below Lewis Street Bridge. Um, yeah, I'd be considerate. <laughs> Definitely, um, and it might get us closer to that small percentage too that we're looking at right now with the model on the table. So just a bit for that. We will think about that. Thanks.
Yeah. Uh, Rob, you can go next online. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate all of the modeling that uh, get, that Derek has done here, and particularly um, trying to get something more on, on the Skycomish. Um, I liked uh, what Rob said about opening the 16th of June and only going to July. Um, and I think that it would be good to model that and see if that would improve it a little bit more. Um, I know that he and others that fish that a lot that I've talked to um, as I've been trying to make some input on this fishery have expressed the same thing that he did. And that is that the um, natural origin fish don't seem to show up until after that July 1st in any numbers. And so I just wanted to um, say I, I encourage that and thank you for all that you're doing um, trying to model this. I'm also encouraged by um, what Derek talked about in area 11 and just reiterating that um, we need to look for the areas where we can get more opportunity without impacting these fish. And I think the data shows that. So thank you very much. Okay, we have one last hand online from Randy. Randy, go ahead. So I'm looking at uh, all of the forecasts. I mean, you're, you're lowering the quota in area seven to 1800 fish, correct? No, Randy, that's a, that's a proposal that we could look at in the modeling tool, um, but that's not, um, that, that's not one of the ones that I put as the preferred option uh, and initial look at the scenarios that I have on screen now. So the still Guamish is still the main uh, factor in the low quotas in green area seven. Is true. Um, in this year, I believe uh, it, Snohomish will be uh, a more limiting stock than still Guamish, and Snohomish uh, does have uh, uh, area seven is one of the places with the highest impacts on Snohomish. Okay, so in the Snohomish. Yeah, they clip all their fish as well, just like the Stilaguamish does, correct? Sorry, I um I, I missed that point. And I also I I didn't hear what you said, Randy, but I did want to clarify on something I'd said just a minute ago. Uh area seven per one thousand impacts is uh higher on Snow Homish than many of our areas. Right now, when we look at area seven in totality, it's uh it's uh it's lower impacts than the other three aforementioned areas, five, nine, and ten. Um, but it also has a lower quota there. So it's um, that, that, that's the reason why we see that lower impact. And, and I apologize, Randy, if you could repeat your question. No, I was just wondering, I mean, uh, all of the marked fish coming out of the Stilaguamish and the Snohomish, uh, a big question, and I've asked it before about the marking of the fish coming out of the Stilaguamish. Is there a chance you could run a model? I, I know that you run a lot of models on what the effect would be if the fish weren't marked how it would affect the return to the rivers. I mean, I've, I've heard I, that there are other systems in, in the Puget Sound that run the same brood stock that don't mark their fish. I mean, I, I'm just wondering if you run a model, if, if they're looking for a bigger return, if, if that would help. I mean, if you ran a model and it showed that, if uh, that would be something we do that because uh, I believe the largest marine area seven is the largest marine area in the sound, and we get the least amount of time on the water and the smallest quotas. Thanks, Randy. Um, I, I I could model that scenario, um, but um, the reason why I would suggest that um, maybe I I um I, I won't um is because um looking at kind of uh, Stillaguamish, it is one of our indicator stocks for the Pacific Salmon Commission. And uh, as an indicator stock for the Pacific Salmon Commission, it's one that we manage to in international yeah. management. Uh, in that process, uh, we need to have uh, marked, uh, marked coated wire tag fish to be able to assess the impacts kind of uh, across uh, Puget Sound and across the array of fisheries that occur up and down the West Coast. Uh, when we have fish that are coated wire tag but not marked, uh, what happens is, is that when they then aren't sampled by uh, some fisheries in Alaska and Canada, 
really in their sampling programs, they're only looking for marked fish for to, to detect coated wire tags. So um, it would really be a challenge, um, um, I, I think, to have those fish as 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 unmarked. So so even if they were unmarked and you got a, a larger return, which is the goal, what what would be wrong if they if you lose a little data but you get more returning fish? We are held by international obligations to have that as one of our stocks that we monitor and, and make uh, an accurate exploitation rate evaluation on. So aren't there other systems that, that run brood stocks that don't mark their fish in the future sound? Yes, there are. So for example, um, uh, uh, Icy Creek and Green River is one, I believe that doesn't mark fish. Uh, I hope I didn't misspeak there. There's, uh, there's White River uh, doesn't mark fish. But those ones aren't ones that we are uh, evaluating as indicator stocks for exploitation rates in the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Well, I, I actually I knew I knew those the answer to that question. It it just it seems that we're we're marking a, a system that's totally affecting fishing in, in one area predominantly, and, and it still seems intentional, but. I would hope that we don't reduce the, the quotas in Marine Area 7. Last year, we got six days. If they got reduced, basically 400 fish, we'd be lucky to get four days. It's uh, it's getting a little uh, hard to justify anything that goes on in this process. I, I look around before I grab call for the mic because um, I don't want to dominate here. I've spoken a, a lot, but um, there aren't any hands up, so I'm talking. Um, uh, before, uh, I, I have made some proposals uh, throughout this year's process and even before this year's process for uh, a number of things, but I'm I'm going to repeat some things, but I want to be really clear about a couple of proposals. So, so really focusing on fishery proposals for 2024, not mass marking fish that's going to affect something in the future or not. Um, number one, thank you, Mark, for mentioning the total mortality index and and acknowledging that uh, the proposal has been to the department for over a year. I, I hope it can mature. I would really like to see it tried this year in a couple of the areas. I don't think it fits everywhere, but it just the, the point there is that you hit on to a degree uh, that it has the benefit of reflecting those very critical impacts on Stiligoamish that are hatchery, com combination of hatchery and natural. And also it reflects a balancing or a weighting of the very small impacts on encounters, but still some mortalities of sublegal and unmarked release fish. But it carries the weight that is appropriate and reflective of the management objectives of total mortality for Stiligoamish and other stocks. So TMI all the way. Number two, uh, my proposal is for supporting a balance of freshwater and marine, some kind of a balance. And I know you're addressing it. I can see uh, for Skycomish fish, an opportunity there. It's really a good fishery. It's a very healthy fishery. It's a mark selective fishery. It's focused on harvestable hatchery fish. And it even has that in season advantage of being able to check on Wallace returns and okay the fishery. And so it's a well run, well monitored fishery. I support it 
totally, but finding a balance in terms of the impacts with marine. We don't want to zero anybody out. Uh, so being efficient, like uh, like you're trying to do here with the FRAM modeling by area and where impacts are highest, this one is the same way. We're only talking about like 0.4% impact with the proposal of the 26 days for fresh water and, uh, and the impacts in a place uh, like uh, Area 7 are, are comparable to that. So you, you have a balance. It's difficult to do, but please find that balance. Please provide more opportunity at least than last year in fresh water for Skycomish, Wallace, Hatchery, Chinook, Mark Selective. Next, uh, it's time for my routine appeal for consideration of a winter Chinook fishery, a step back into the past. Uh, the closures are really relatively recent for many of these areas. Total closure, um, that's tough. Very small fishery. I like the way that you put it up there, Kirsten, with the description is just low impact, uh, well, whatever it said, it was very small. And the proposal specifically that I have here um, uh, today is a little bit different than I had earlier in the process where I suggested that partly for the reasons of addressing the problems with higher effort, concentrating effort at times when we have only one fishery open, it's the only game in town, a lot of people are going to take buy tickets and if you could have it spread out that's a good thing so the address was uh, the original proposal was area 7 8 1 8 2 and 9 all have a uh, opening of a march fishery simultaneous with area 11 and 10 uh, to address the distribution dispersion of effort that could reduce and maintain a low impact fishery also, uh, those were originally suggested to be very small numbers, representing only two days per week for the month of March in those areas that I mentioned. Well, um, not seeing much lift happening since I originally proposed that, uh, I'm negotiating with myself here, and I'm modifying my proposal to just Area 7. I don't want to pick out one area because it seems to be that uh, it might be thought that I'm preferring one area, but I do see advantages in area seven to this winter mark fishery, mark select fishery, or really just a blackmouth fishery, that area seven has the uh, lowest sublegal to legal impact, excuse me, uh, the fishery is, it's got a very high uh, proportion of legal and marked fish, something like 85% for legal fish. And so it's a very good fishery, a very clean fishery in those terms. It is it is better than the other candidate fisheries for winter reopening. Um, also, the while it wasn't modeled directly, Derek, you did do one of the um, uh, options here in one of the previous versions of the uh, spreadsheet version of the area by area, fishery by fishery modeling impacts. And it showed with 1,000 fish in area seven that there would be uh, a very small impact for Piliguamish fish. The proposal that I have now is 250 fish for that, and so I believe that it would have only one still a Guamish mort in the calculations for the 60 to 65. It would be an increase from where you are at right now, but it's very small. I believe that it would be a popular fishery, but having it opened on a Thursday and Friday each week would certainly dampen down effort. Look, we're not trying to get derby fisheries out of this thing. We're trying to just have a placeholder 
and a reminder that this is a the winter fishing opportunity blackmouth fishing is a very important socio economic fishery sport fishing is in total but this one is a great um like a cultural thing for us anywhere that blackmouth fishing occurs it is let's keep it alive let's not take the um ventilator off of the patient here let's keep it alive so so my proposal then for area seven black winter black mouth is the month of march for openings of two days thursday and friday with a catch limit of 250 fish and and here's the whopper non-selective this fishery, one of the problems with it is that having it be mark selective for some reason, and I still, Derek, we've interacted here on this one, I cannot figure out how the hatchery stock impacts are so high for this winter fishery in Area 7. There's a couple other fisheries that are mark selective that are very, very high. The ratio of hatchery Stiliguamish to natural Stiliguamish is, well, there's more natural fish this year predicted than there are hatchery fish. And so in all the other fisheries, even in the sport fishery just across the Salish Sea there in the Strait for BC, the proportion of hatchery to natural excuse me, natural to hatchery is 0.85. There are fewer uh, hatchery to natural, fewer hatchery fish than natural fish. So we're getting uh, in the sport fishery, if you modeled it, you're going to get about three times the hatchery fish as you're going to get natural fish. That's what will happen when you model it, if you did model it. So don't model it as a mark selective fishery, model it as a non-selective fishery minimize the total mortalities in that fishery being very high to hatchery fish and you will have a very low impact overall with a combination of all those features plus you do not need to have test fishing which is a very expensive part of the program for wdfw and all of the marine fisheries you don't need that as a part of the agreement in the resource management plan for Chinook, you are required to have a Murthy estimator in place, and that's fair. But we don't, because it's mark, not mark selective, we do not need to make indirect estimates of the proportion of hatchery and wild that are landed or released because they're not going to be released. They're going, so you can keep a wild fish, you can keep a hatchery fish marked and unmarked, it'll be presented at the dock and collected and you'll have the information to make your estimates. Selective fisheries are costly in terms of data. Non-selective fisheries are less costly. Um, finally, uh, to supplement the sampling program, because it is costly to even collect it at the dock, I suggest that the fishery be a, a requirement for any participant, for each boat that participates in that marine area to have on board voluntary trip reports and submit those. So that's my uh, black mouth revitalization program proposal. Now, finally, coho, wrapping it up. My coho proposal is simple. Uh, it <clears throat> is, I, I recognize the, the modeling um, uncertainties, and there was some discussion about updating coho models, and I have not seen those yet. Um, I haven't seen Chinook models yet either, but for coho, there was some, um, I think there were some corrections for uh, Hood Canal commercial fishery impacting coho. Regardless, here's my proposal. For areas eight, two, and nine, 
make them the same season as area eight one. And for area seven, so that would be extending that into the first week of October for those two areas, just as it is right now in the matrix that was shown here for area eight one, keep them the same. Don't, you know, let's have, have similarities between areas and fisheries as much as possible. Finally, area seven in September, when it is non-selective for coho, have it be a two fish bag limit. Those are my proposals and recommendations. Thank you. I could take just a second to respond to, to, to Pat there. I see the hand raised, Carl. Um, so um, uh, a lot of the suggestions there, we, we did explore in the meeting on uh, on the 13th. And so I'm gonna be pretty brief on responding to some of those. If folks would like more information about um, our, our full thoughts on those suggestions, I, I would encourage you to go back and watch that meeting on the 13th. But, um, but in terms of uh, the Marine Area 7 winter fishery, uh, I, I would have some major concerns this year. Uh, and if you look at per 1,000 impacts, uh, that is the fishery that has the largest impact on the Snohomish stock. In addition to that, while it isn't the largest impact per 1,000 fish on Nooksack Springs, uh, it is right out front of that area, and especially a non-selective fishery where we're looking at uh, where we're looking at a year where there's such poor escapement, and we're going to be working with our co-managers to determine what the appropriate objective is. I, I, I could imagine that that would uh, be of some cause for concern to both us and the co-managers. Um, it is also one of the ones, while not the highest, it, it does have a, a decent impact on still Guamish per 1,000. I recognize what you're proposing is a relatively low quota, but I have concerns in and of that, that of, it, of itself, just because um, that fishery hasn't happened in, in quite a few years. I, I think that people would be very excited uh, for the reasons that you mentioned. I think people would be very excited about that fishery. And uh, a, quote, a quota of 250 can get blown by so fast, potentially in a single day. So it makes it really challenging to monitor and, 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 and stay within our impacts for a fishery in, in, with, with such a small quota. Lastly, one thing that you mentioned there is that if it were a non-selective fishery that we, we wouldn't have to pre perform test fishing uh, for, that, for that fishery. While historically that would have been true, I think that we're held to any fishery with, uh, with a it's still a Guamish impacts greater than 0.1 by the still a Guamish payback model. I think we're held to be within uh, a monitoring plan that where we can assess those impacts. So I, I think that there's there's multiple reasons why I, I would be really hesitant to go with that proposal in this year. Uh, I, I'd like to explore it in future years, maybe when Snohomish and Nooksack Springs aren't as as, as big of a concern. Uh, but for, for this year and uh, the exploration that I've done, uh, I, I, I don't see it. And I hope I didn't misspeak. Mark, please correct me if I said anything that you think is incorrect there, Kirsten. But that's the way that I view it. Uh, oh, there is one other piece, uh, maybe on a more positive note. Uh, for coho options, we, we do have a scenario to a pool for coho that we haven't put up yet. Uh, maybe um, uh, maybe after Carl's question, it's a good time to shift over to Ty and look at some of this. Oh, I have a question on Zoom too, Derek. Well, so. Uh, maybe when we get through this set of questions, maybe we'll skip over to some of the scenarios that Ty's looked at for Coho in his tool. We'll shift online real quick, and then we'll get you, Carl. Uh, and first hand is Gordon. Gordon, go ahead. Yeah, so it was mentioned uh, catch limits uh, and the fact that it could be done per angler instead of multiple, you know, certain anglers filling out two or three cards a year. Um, what um, consideration has been given to that? And how do, how would that impact our quotas? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I'm not saying that it's something that we've, we have done a whole lot of work into considering how that would work. Um, it's a suggestion that we hear on a pretty, pretty regular basis. It would kind of mimic um, some of the systems that are in place in Alaska and some other areas. Um, one of the issues that we have with that system is that it would be really hard to enforce. Um, our enforcement is strapped pretty thin as it is right now. So um, I, I would say that we haven't given it a whole lot of serious consideration, but it's something that we hear. And so we, it's worth mentioning that folks are, are interested in that. I might also add that, you know, uh, limiting hatchery Chinook harvest uh, when we have uh, quite a few uh, 
places and hatcheries around Puget Sound that have uh, significant uh, surpluses of fish returning. I don't think, uh, you know, limiting the amount of hatchery fish we take is necessarily the, the best solution overall. We're always limited in all these things around the amount of uh, natural stocks that we're impacting in these fisheries. So it's not a matter of, you know, available hatchery fish and trying to limit that harvest. It's the, you know, part of the, the choice that we make to fish pre-terminally in, in mixed stock areas, you know, we're, we're, we, we've had this paradigm where we're, we're held to these rates of, of impact on natural stocks. And so that's, that's really the limiter. It's not about, you know, people harvesting too many hatchery fish. So getting back to, you know, kind of coattailing on Pat's comments about symmetry in the fisheries so that, you know, we kind of avoid these uh, derby fisheries in one area that's open. Um, we just concluded this winter fishery in Marine Area 10. And um, uh, I'd be curious to know how that went over. Uh, yeah, hopefully that's not affecting current discussions with our co-managers that we, we did. It was a pretty clean fishery. I mean, it was mostly legal marked fish, but we do have that still Aguamish issue with marked fish um uh, you know my concern about that is, is that you know last year during this process we tried to line it up with marine area five for the winter fishery and then kind of at the very end of the process marine area five shifted its fishery that, that decided to open april one and so it did not align with marine area 10 so we did end up with this massive sort of effort in marine area 10 especially and it was a great fishery um, so looking forward, you know, if we're still modeling, if Area 5 is still looking to open April 1 in the, this next set of packaging for their winter fishery, um, you know, how can we improve the fishery for Area 10 and 11? Can we move it to April 1 through 30th? Or do we run it, you know, we've never gone past April 15th in Marine Area 10, not never, but, you know, not for decades. So do we run into Nisqually Springer problems? Um, is, is that an option? Can we propose that? How can we align those winter fisheries? Is that still a possibility? We have time left in this process or, you know, even starting March 15th. Our idea was always to get into April um, or, you know, can we get together with Brandon and discuss, you know, can they move theirs up to March 15th or, or uh, you get what I'm you know, what I'm leaning towards here is that we would like to try to align those fisheries if possible, have as many areas open at the same time so that we can spread out the effort and try to get a little more time on the water for the folks in marine area 10 to kind of stretch that fishery out a little bit and avoid that sort of derby fishery where all the boats are concentrated in one area um, and then uh, the other thing i just wanted to clarify is on the on the slideshow you guys said uh, july chinook opener and nine and ten and i'm assuming you meant thursday the 18th um, is what you're modeling, but I just wanted to get a clarification on that. So we haven't really landed on any opening dates, Carl. Uh, it's really just a, a quota level or a harvest level now that we're, we're modeling. Uh, I think we were waiting to see where that all landed out and then have those discussions with, with folks uh, as we're in PFMC about what makes the most sense. Uh, you know, I think we centered around that, that weekend around, or the, the weekday starting around the 18th as, as Kirsten and I were uh, looking at the tides and, and seeing that the, the previous weekend in July, the tides really weren't that great. There wasn't a whole lot of exchange and thought um, anglers might have a, a better time or, or more robust opportunity fishing in that next week when the tides are much better. Spoken like a true field biologist. And the, uh, any comments on the, winter for uh, maybe for Derek uh, I mean I mean you shifting know, the winter later do we run into this Wally or uh, you, I'm sure you have Brandon and Glenn's number I mean you know if if you guys want to try to bring us a proposal of, of what something might look like we we'd certainly consider it I mean you know currently things are as they were modeled last year so if there's desires to align all those areas around opening and closing dates that's something we can totally consider can can area could area 10 potentially have an April 1 through 30th? We've never gone to the 30th. Is that possible to even model or do we run into spring? You can work on that 
in in the background and let me know later, Derek. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. This is Kurt Kramer. I, I'd like to return to the Guycomish River fishery for a second. Part of the policy governing this North of Falcon process is that it, it refers to as the salmon and steelhead process. And, you know, steelhead and Skycomish is an ESA listed fish. And there is some small impacts uh, fishing in late May, early June on both kelts and even some unspawned uh, wild steelhead in the, in the Skycomish River. So moving, it makes a lot of sense for that benefit just from the steelhead of moving the season to later in the summer. I suspect, you know, it's got a long-term uh, real history on it, that there's probably some pretty good information to look at the, the wild fish, unmarked fish to marked fish ratios during the course of the season, and it should be able to maybe parse out the optimum time to craft such a fishery. You, know, you got, I don't know, 20 plus years of data that to look at, I think that would be really advantageous. And it just makes uh, logical sense from a couple of reasons. The other thing that's going on in the Skycomish River, as you know, the production goals, egg take goals at the Wallace Hatchery has been increased from 5 million fish to 8 million fish. And, and that means you're going to have more fish coming back, which means there's a lot going to be some more hatchery fish in the river that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. And we're going to know that 20 or 30 percent of those fish are not going to come back to the hatchery rack. So that's, you know, I mean, it just makes the whole issue a whole bunch more complicated. But that's that's my two bits of there. Um, in terms of the past proposal on on the um, winter blackmouth season, the the Stillwater fish is a kind of a, a, a crazy stock of fish. If you look at when those fish show up in the river, they look like some sort of hybrid between spring and summer chinook. You know, and there's fish showing up in late April or May in the river already, and almost all the fish, you know, at least on the North Fork side of the basin, appear to be in the river by. Um, mid-July, um, you know, and that and that's the stock that we model off of, right, Eric, or Derek? And, and you know, it, that sounds more spring chinook-like than some of, you know, certainly more than the fall stocks we have running around. Um, you know, in terms of the marking, I think the, the program on the hatchery program is only about 200,000 fish a year, and that's, you know, that's a kind of a minimum size to address the code wire tag issues that Derek was talking about. So there's really not much leg room in there. When I looked at when the raw tags were recovered in Marine Area 7, again, the bulk of those fish were recovered in March, late February and March, which is, again, kind of spring chinook-like. And I, I think that's what makes it kind of a difficult thing to deal with. And one final comment about a, uh, a small quota fishery in Marine Area 7. The history has been given an opportunity, there will be a derby on those fish, which makes it much more to deal, deal with. And I don't think the agency still has any tools to control when and if derbies occur. Just some immediate thoughts. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kurt. I always really appreciate the knowledge and expertise that you bring to the table on each of these stocks, especially still Aguamish and Snohomish. I just wanted to comment that uh, uh, your analysis is matches what I've seen, is that those, uh, those still Aguamish fish tend to be caught kind of in the winter months in our fisheries. They are based off a of summer indicator stock. There are two hatchery facilities on Stillaguamish. There's the White Horse Hatchery, which releases that summer stock. And then there's a, a South Fork Hatchery, the Brenner facility, which is uh, producing kind of more of those fall-based fish. But what we're using in the modeling right now is that is that summer-based stock. Um, uh, one comment back to Snohomish. Um, I think I've heard from you and for multiple folks now about the value of potentially looking at rearranging some of those dates on that season. Uh, my team's going to get together with uh, Pete and take that into consideration. I think after this meeting, we've heard multiple comments on it now. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, maybe in our next modeling proposal, we'll look at something that makes sense in terms of what we could craft there and staying off the later time periods. Hello there, Rodney Harris. Has there been, uh, when is that uh, Marine Area 5 opener planned for? Is that a July 1st opener? In, in the summertime? Yes. July 1st through August 15th. Has there been any thought about a delayed opener on that for two weeks to buy you any Snohomish fish? There will still be fishing on the peninsula. Area 6 will be open. Yeah, I've actually I've thought a lot about that. And um, it's one of the options that uh, I don't know if uh, either Glenn or Brandon are in the room. It uh, probably uh, uh, 
Uh, I know that that July period is really valuable to the folks out there, uh, but there could be value in it, uh, especially because if there's a greater overlap with that coho period, uh, then um, then rather than modeling uh, non-retention impacts on Chinook during that coho period, uh, if we overlapped those more, then we could have a reduced impact during that non-retention period and and therefore save on Snohomish and some of the other sets we're looking at. I think that there... I think that there could really be potential value in looking at that, but that's, I guess, a discussion for us all to have. I know it's not popular, and if I fished that on July 1st, I wouldn't like it either. But if that seems to be a hard hitter, I don't know. Handwriting's kind of on the wall there a little bit, I think. That's it, though. Thank you. Thank you. I saw a hand in the back of the room, Kelly. Hi. I'm Norm Reinhardt. Before I come to these, I really feel. Just like a lot of other folks. Um, Marine Area 10. I was taking a look at some things. Um, I see it's going to be opened mid-July through mid-August. At least that's the proposal I saw on the bar chart earlier in the presentation. Um, I also understand that looking at the numbers, the Snohomish, um, there's a challenge right there in Marine Area 10 on the Snohomish. So that being said, is there any value? Prime time in Area 10 for Canes is not the middle of July. It usually kicks off the last week of July, first week of August. Is there any potential of being impact neutral in shifting that fishery Marine Area 10 fishery to a lighter, le later time frame. And then I'll, I'll see my coho question, that June coho fishery question for coho discussion. That's my first thing. Secondly, as I always do, um, and I would have liked to thank the department for going into negotiating with the Skokomish this year in a plan for a potential possibility of reopening the river part of the river that's in, in well that we're being contentious about there's other areas of the river that could be open are we looking at any of that i hope we are and the last thing i want to say is that someone mentioned or i think it was mark was talking about someone mark selected fisheries and putting an annual quota on us, hurting that, our harvesting mark selective fisheries. Maybe it's time we started thinking outside of the box and started thinking about other ways of harvesting these fish in terminal areas, like at the hatcheries. So we can access those mark selective fish that we can put a dent in that surplus. And now whether that is a net fishery, and Mark and I have had that discussion, there's, there's a lot of work to do on that as far as a dip net fishery. Um, and I'm just going to put it out there, a floss fishery, snag fishery, however you want to put it, very limited in nature, very specific, very controlled. I understand we have an enforcement issue, but that's an enforcement issue. We also have an issue of Harvesting mark selective fish. And it's more and more it's hurting us in the marine areas. Can we shift that effort somehow? Thank you. So Kelly, the gentleman in the back of the room has had his hand raised for a little while here. Um, I saw that there was a few other hand ra hands raised uh, and I don't wanna cut off discussions um, but um, I would like to transition to Ty's coho modeling tool soon, just to make sure that we have a little bit of time for discussion on that as well. So I wanted to bring up uh, pinnipeds a little bit. Nobody's talking about bird predation, avian predation, or pinniped predation. We could, we could gain so many more fish, both salt and in the freshwater, if we could control the pinnipeds. Um, and I know it's a subject that, Nobody really wants to talk about the tribes don't want to talk about it because of bad PR. 
the department's kind of avoiding it. Um, we could gain a lot of ground if we control our pinnipeds. And I know uh, the feds are allowing us to do so. Um, is anybody willing to touch this issue, discuss it? Well, I'll uh, I'll try to respond, and uh, I, I see a, a couple of leaders above me in in the room from from the agency. If I get too far over my skis, so um, we have been addressing it within our ability to do so uh, under the laws that are in front of us. Right, um, we've been working uh, with regulators on the Columbia River, and have gotten some variants on the Columbia River to to take out uh, some more individuals uh, over time. And, you know, I think that's a, an ongoing uh, uh, evaluation and assessment and, and um, um, paradigm that they're working on in the Columbia River. It gets a little harder in Puget Sound. Uh, I think there's, there's differences of opinion, but we are really held under the constraints of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, it's, it's really, it almost takes an act of Congress uh, to get some variance for that and, and be able to you know, there's there's some strict requirements about identifying individuals uh, over a period of time before we can think about lethal removal. Uh, I can assure you it's a concern uh, amongst all the co-managers, uh, tribes and the state. Um, you know, I think there's also uh, opinions out there by uh, uh, some biologists that there's not really a, a huge problem in Puget Sound. Um, you know, I think we can all agree to disagree on on certain issues, but, you know, uh, I'm not a marine mammal expert, and and really we can talk about it in this forum. But what we're really here to talk about is is fishing seasons and proposals around fishing seasons. So I realize it's a tangential uh, problem when it when we're talking about these things. Uh, I think uh, as fishermen and people who uh, are out there in nature, we see a lot of these things uh, as we're participating in these activities, and and you know. We have the same thoughts you do uh, about, you know, if something could be done. Um, I don't have a whole lot of experience in, in these kind of realms, but I guess uh, I just I get really skeptical uh, about trying to solve one problem and potentially creating two or three others uh, by, a, you know, a, a simple solution by just calling a bunch of marine mammals. Right. So uh, that's my thoughts. And I don't know if any other uh, people want to take a stab at what I've said or just move on from there. but. Thanks, Mark. Not not a whole bunch to add other than just to be crystal clear with with folks. <clears throat> the, uh, the the agency is going to comply with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. There 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 at this time there isn't a a, a free for all uh, on on marine mammals. So we've got obligations that and federal regulations that we are obligated to comply with, and 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 that's what we're going to do. Just talking a little bit about uh, Area 10 last year, part of the problems we, we had there with regard to the sampling program, the seasons we had. We left over 2,000 Chinook on the because of a flawed test fishing protocol that could not discern a jack from a sublegal. Question one is, what has the department done to address this? We've, we've seen gear studies and other things that are you know basically academic activities that could only serve to restrict sport anglers access to the resource and access to their tackle box, essentially. I would like to see something from the department that would dig into the sampling protocol. Actually, able to 2,000 fish in area 10. Part two to the question is, what is the problem with opening up Lingham Bay fishery on August rather than waiting for the current Let's go in. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll uh, address the Bellingham Bay. We can certainly look at it, Tom. Uh, 
you know, our recreational catches in Bellingham Bay aren't huge. So it certainly seems like it's, uh, it's something that we can look at and evaluate. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with your, your assertion that it was the test fishing that caused the area 10, uh, you know, part of me feels like you're confusing what happened in area. That was, that was in area 11, Tom. So in the modeling and in our evaluation, we don't distinguish between sublegals and jacks. That's not part of our management. Why is that a problem? We're not trying. We're not trying to preserve sexually precocious. They're they're not something we're trying to protect. These are hatchery fish. There's hatchery fish, ostensibly due to increased hatchery plants in some areas. Okay. I don't think you have all your facts straight, Tom. So I'd, I'd be happy to circle up with you and the staff and make sure that we're all on the same page about what happened last year and what contributed to the uh, evaluation of the seasons last year. But I don't, I don't agree with your assertion of how things went down. I've asked a question about, about test fishing data only to hear it from your mouth, and I quote, you'll get them when you get them, only to hear from Kirsten's mouth, again, you'll get them where you get them. Um, you know, some of the ways that, that staff has interacted with the advisor group is, is not acceptable. I'd like to remind you that you are public servants, and, and yet us and the public have been treated a little less than cordial at times. So if you want us to have a better interpretation of the data, then this data could come at a more timely complete and accurate form. Thank you. you get the data distributed weekly, just like everybody else on our distribution list. In questioning that as, as well, if you think we're getting weekly numbers of, of test fishing data, and even catch estimates, then I'll dig back through my email and, and show you the large gaps. You know, your assertion they come every week is not even close to accurate. Next question. Is that good? Okay. Um, I just want to touch back on the predation issue. We just talked about pinniped predation. Didn't really touch base on avian predation, which is kind of the low hanging fruit for the department. Is that better? Okay. Just want to touch base on avian predation more so than pinniped predation because it's kind of low hanging fruit that we can go after. Anything for avian predation, bergansers, terns, things like that. You know, fish at all stages of their life. Is there any steps being taken towards them? So um, maybe I'll let Mark add a little bit of a follow up to this one in a second. Um, but avian predation is an interesting one because I don't think it gets quite as much attention as the pinniped predation and uh, some of the other predation that we that, that we could see. Um, I don't have a whole lot of information on avian predation, uh, but what I would be willing to share with you is there was a study that the, uh, the Chinook Technical Committee, part of that international management process, had conducted a few years back on the Columbia River. And what they were doing is they were uh, pit tagging released Chinook. And uh, they were looking at, uh, and then what they were doing is they were trying to recover those pit tags in, uh, in, in bird droppings in, in colonies of, 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 of different avian predators. Uh, as a part of the work that they were doing. And I think it had some really interesting results. I I'd be very happy to share that with you if you send me an email. I could show you kind of what, what their study had looked at. As far as um, uh, what you'd mentioned on, uh, uh, do we have kind of a, 
any management of that. I, I, I don't I don't know. I'm not an expert on that topic, so maybe I'll just uh, see if Mark has any further comments. But uh, if you email me, I'd be glad to share those studies with you. I have nothing to add, Derek. Thanks. The problem. What are the constraints um, as far as being listed, tested, et cetera, et cetera? On this one, uh, uh, since I work very exclusively on fish, uh, I don't know if we have the right uh, folks in the room to answer, answer questions on, on hunting. Uh, but if, if you'd like, send Leah an email afterwards, and she might be able to get you into contact with somebody from the wildlife department. How's that? Um, it, it, you know, the shaker legal ratio changes pretty dramatically over the season. You know, the shaker population is essentially a static population, and as the wild or the hatchery run adults build during the course of the season towards the peak, the ratio has to change. And so there's got to be some benefits of delaying the openers from early in July or late July, you know, mid July to re you know reduce the shaker to legal catch that first week or two and and i don't know whether i know the test fisheries are out fishing prior see prior to the, the opening day of the season you know and i don't know whether those ratios caught during say the first week of july are applied to that first week of sports catch and if so that might overestimate the, the shaker stuff the shaker ratio and that's something just to keep a really close eye on. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the ratio of the first week in August is, is different than it is in the first week of, of July. It's just something to consider. It, unfortunately, in a previous life, I spent a fair amount of time looking at cormorants and the interactions with fish. It's way out of the preview of a fish biologist, but you know, it, I did do that. Historically, there was a lot of double crest cormorants that moved into this country in, in the, the 80s. They primarily wintered in Puget Sound. They eat lots of fish, but then, you know, I think they were eating lots of hake originally. But, you know, come the 1st of May, they would move south to the Columbia and create their problems. But unfortunately, in the last, you know, since the mid-90s, there's been a developing colony of double crest cormorants on the mouth of Snohomish and as well on Smith Island, I think. And, and you know, that's just, you know, that's a changing dynamic. I, I don't think we can harvest those under waterfowl seasons because they're not considered a waterfowl species. And waterfowl is pretty directly defined by species that we can we can shoot. But that's all. So, Kurt, I think I'll just um, talk to your your part about the the test fishing in early July in areas like Area Ten. So, only the test fishing data that's in season is used to create those estimates. So, if there's a low uh, sublegal ratio in early part of July, but then that raises that comes up as July goes on, only the numbers for the portion of the of July that the fishery is open are applied to to the the calculation of the estimates. So, and that's one of the things that we watch is, you know, kind of how that sublegal ratio changes over the course of the season. Um, Ty Garber has done a lot of work looking at that um, and potential uh, ways that we could use that information to kind of adjust fisheries in season as well. Uh, it's something that was talked about during North of Falcon 1. Um, so if you want to have, if you want to, we can go into that more at a later date, but I'd also, um, if you remember back from North of Falcon 1, I think it was mentioned during that meeting as well. So. Um, yeah, so a lot, a lot going on there, but yeah, only the in-season test fishery data is applied to the estimate calculation. So if there's a low ratio when the season's not open, it doesn't affect those estimates.
Thank you, Alex Van Hine here. I just would like to make a comment on the importance, and Derek, we touched on this in a couple of meetings back, the importance of updating our FRAM model couldn't seem any more vital today than it ever has been before. When we're working on data that I think expired sometime around, I won't say expired, that reaches 2017, when we're applying real-time data such as catch effort, uh, catch per day, we're doing we're using those real time numbers to implement uh, changes and adjustments to our encounters or to our quotas. But we're running off a Fram model that included a period of time that uh, we know that had less than ideal ocean conditions. We certainly weren't, and I'm always going to relate back to some of our northern fisheries, but uh, we certainly didn't have the Samish hatchery returns that we're seeing now. Um, so when we talk about a marine area seven uh, per 1,000 impact ratio, uh, that's based off of CWT data that is you know, approaching seven years old. We're not seeing necessarily the, the more, most accurate picture of what we're seeing for abundances in our current fisheries. Uh, so I know you said it takes a lot of work, but we're dealing with a season setting process that appears to be as volatile as ever before. Uh, when we're protecting percentage points or percentage pieces of fish um, when we're, we're clearly not using a body of work that's as, as up-to-date as it could be. Uh, that's it for now. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. And I, I, I do agree with you. Uh, the most up-to-date, uh, best information we can use is, is going to help us uh, as uh, the most in the modeling. I know this is not where I'm going to start in a place where I know you were talking to Chinook. Uh, we had done an evaluation about a year or two ago um, in our unit, uh, looking particularly at the coho base period since that since the Chinook one had been updated more recently. And we were looking at the different pieces that we would need to be able to update that that base range of years that we're using in coho. Uh, one thing that we're finding for coho is that um, some of the stocks that we're trying to represent in the modeling, uh, uh, there's uh, insufficient sample sizes we're getting in terms of um, either those fish weren't tagged or they were tagged at lower rates or in some fisheries we're not able to get those sample sizes. So we're seeing it in coho as, as a difficulty, uh, a problem in being able to update that base period and it's kind of ongoing discussions as to what we're using there. Now, uh, speaking a little bit more to Chinook, which is uh, what you were mentioning there, yeah, it, our, our Chinook base period's several years old now. Um, and um, we do have an update cycle that's scheduled. It's about once every 10 years we're, we're looking at that base period. It is a huge time investment. To get out this new base period, it, it took us probably five years between the technical work that occurred. There was seven iterations of updating that base period, and then, uh, and then there was negotiations that occurred with it as well. So it's something that that that, that uh, will be important and something that we'll be looking at in the future, uh, but uh, but it's one of these things that it's not. If we wanted to update the base period right now for this North of Falcon, it's something that just uh, it can't happen. When we're when we're when we're looking at it, um, uh, the we're looking at hundreds of thousands of coded wire tag recoveries that we're kind of QAQCing for that process. We have a whole bunch of different parameters and processes that we're inputting it's, it's a really uh, major endeavor by kind of not only our technical group but also by the tribes and NOAA, and, and NOAA as well for the uh, Tulela return this year and for the Samish numbers I may have missed them somewhere but is that out there give me just one second I'll see if I can look those up real fast And uh, just making sure, you, uh, I think you think I mentioned Chinook there. Yep. It looks like uh, for this year for Samish, uh, looking at age three to five year olds, it's uh, forty five thousand fish returning approximately, and then um, and then it looks like maybe you already have the forecast sheet in, in front of you there. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, and then for Tulalip, let's see, for Tulalip it's five thousand nine hundred, age three to five. 
45,000. Samish is one of our largest hatchery programs uh, in terms of return, if not our very largest one in Puget Sound. I'm not sure. I'd have to look into it. I don't know if either Ed or Pete uh, are aware. Be able to speak to it. Kirsten, uh, Kirsten, Kirsten reminded me that that might have been the Wallace Hatchery in Snohomish, where, where we saw those. Oh, well, that was the Wallace? Yes. One of the problems is they increased it, I think, four years ago, which you, you had returns coming off of the normal plant, and it takes a, a, basically a generation of the fish to build up the, the broodstock to the point that you can consistently make that those goals. It just it takes, you know, you, it, it doesn't just happen overnight. The guys have fish coming back from 5,000, so they've, you know, they have some surpluses, but sometimes it takes a little while. So I kind of want to take a temperature in the room. We're, we're getting close to the noon hour. Uh, I don't want to cut off conversation. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, staff could probably use five minute stretch break if, if that was acceptable. I didn't know if folks had a, a thoughts about maybe taking a lunch break. Uh, we could take a longer break and, and come back. I, I believe we have the room till three this afternoon. So uh, plenty of opportunity to, to still take some time. Uh, if, if folks are more interested in, in just continuing the discussion, I, I would uh, propose maybe we take a short break uh, and then continue the discussion after that. Um, short break rather than a lunch break. Okay, how about we do 15 minutes and come back at uh, 1215. Okay, folks, please find your seats. We're going to get back together. So to, to start off the, the kind of next section, uh, you know, we had talked about, um, we also had a modeling tool available that went over some suggestions around coho seasons. So I'm going to recognize Ty Garber. He's going to walk us through some of that uh, that we've been looking at as far as adjustments from the current proposal and addressing some of the scenarios that we've taken suggestions on and, and what that does to the current modeling just a reminder for everybody where we are currently, we're, we're over on our Snohomish objective for coho. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there haven't been any fisheries adjustments since the uh, initial modeling proposal. So this also includes tribal fisheries uh, and, you know, uh, looking at the, at, at the ocean options as they currently sit. We know that there's going to be movement. Um, mostly we just want to make sure that we're taking feedback on, on any suggested uh, changes. Uh, that may come down the road, but knowing that there's lots of pieces that that need to fall into place before uh, you know we get to a final package here. Um, with that, I'm going to recognize Ty. He's going to go over the Coho tool, and then we'll continue with comments and questions. Thanks, everybody. Um, so this is very similar to the one that Derek presented. They're based on the same source code. Um, I don't have nearly as many scenarios uh, as Derek did. Um, and I also don't have as many um, dials to pull as Derek does. So, like, with coho, I could change a fishery from mark select to non-selective. I could change the footprint of the fishery, so the number of days open, and also the bag limits. Um, Derek just could have more options to speak with. Um, so, much much simpler than, than what Derek had. Um, on the top here um, are the goals and the um, estimate um, being a product of these uh, radio button changes in here um, as uh, if this something goes over it'll change to a, a light pink color in here so the first one um, uh, trying to address the Snohomish um, uh, overage here you can see right here on 41.2 percent so like some of these are changing current non-selective fisheries to mark selective fisheries some of them are uh, messing with bag limits um, and some of them are 
uh, changing the number of pings that we get. So you can see, um, you know, trying to focus on area seven here, trying to um, uh, uh, increase the bag limit. It's currently one fish bag, trying to, trying to get it up to two fish. Um, you can see in here, like if I go full on uh, two fish sport bag in September in here that you're still under on Thompson. But go ahead. Um, so you could see on, uh, area seven for non-selective two fish bag limit, uh, we still have a little bit of room on Thompson, which is a big constraint around this. Um, it does increase in Homish, which we've got to be, you know, that's going to be the main constraint in Puget Sound this year. Um, so it, things are still in flux here. Um, uh, nothing's really settled. Um, and as it settles, like... This, uh, this tool will be updated with more recent model runs. It's available online. You can play with it. I'll take suggestions. If anybody wants suggestions on here, I could do those really quickly. It'll be up on the internet within a day. Somebody have any questions? Go ahead. I think it was last year the, the Snohomish River was um no longer a rebuilding wasn't there a constraining on it in 2021 and then last year was it midsummer or early fall i read on the website your website that uh snohomish was no longer in the rebuilding process is that correct yeah so uh under the magnus and stevens uh fishery act uh the snohomish coho stock i believe it was following the, the 2015 season was designated as overfished as part of that process. Uh, the co-managers along with uh, um, uh, NOAA and the, the salmon technical team from the Pacific council got together. Uh, there was also the, the JDF stock that was also in that as, as well as Queets on the coast. Uh, I believe all of those stocks are out uh, of the rebuilding and in, uh, you know, considered in rebuilt status at this point. But yes, you are correct. Uh, Snohomish has been a, a recent year constrainer uh, around a lot of our fisheries for coho. So just to clarify, it went from no no longer to now it's 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 considered rebuilt under under the 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 Fishery Act and and those designations for the, for those stocks. But for this year, the data came in and it's so just because it's considered rebuilt doesn't mean that the fisheries, uh, you know, basically what's going on this year is the abundances are such and the fisheries in the model are such that we're not meeting the exploitation rate obje objective for that stock for this year. So that's what we're looking at up on the screen here is we need to be at a 40% exploitation rate objective and we're slightly above that in the, in the current modeling. A little over one and a quarter percent. Correct. Okay, thank you. Hi, thanks, Ty, for this. Um, before I quickly, before I get to what I want to promote, I, I will just say the department probably should be aware of the climate and the tone in which the stakeholders are feeling towards this overall setting process and the fact that we're trying to we're trying to build seasons and we're trying to build what we're going to be looking at here in this upcoming season, but we're doing it under a premise that we don't have an ocean option finished. We don't have our Northern impacts submitted. So we're really treading water to do anything actually productive. And I think most of us who are on the calls during the PFMC week know that that's really when, things start to to move and get formulated. So I would ask that maybe the, the department understands that this is an opportunity for us to voice concerns on other issues. And yeah, we, we all want to take time to, to formulate our packages, but 
um, naturally we are going to feel imposed to uh, voice some grievances uh, in some rightful areas. Uh, but Ty, as far as Coho is concerned, uh, I absolutely promote any option that gives us an additional bag limit on a non-selective fishery in Area 7 that does not impact the Homish uh, numbers at all. If we, I see, well, 0 0.0, Excuse me. Uh, po yeah, 0.04% increase on Snohomish for us increasing to a two fish bag limit non selective for the entire month of sept September while still remaining underneath the 10% uh, ER objected for Thompson. Uh, all missions go. Please. Thanks. Um, I guess I should say uh, my name, Patrick Walker. I've lived in Washington my whole life, grew up on Puget Sound. I live and breathe salt water. I'm not a terminal fishing guy. I can't catch them in a terminal area. So um, some people are, are uh, suggesting that terminal area fisheries for coho and well, more for Chinook, um, they're really hard to catch. I guess I'm a bad fisherman in a terminal area, but everywhere else I seem to do pretty well. Um, fishing with my dad out in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, 2004 was the first time I got back into fishing from when I caught my first Chinook at eight years old off of Nia Bay, 20 pounder, and fishing with my dad who was older, and he said, I can't believe that we have to throw back coho and we're killing them because it's mark selective. I know that's the world we live in. And I said, well, dad, that's just the way it is. And he said, it's bullshit. That's my dad's words, not mine. Sorry, I said that. But <clears throat> where I'm going is coho fishing is one of my favorites because it doesn't take as much technical skill everybody can do it so what this gentleman over here was saying for area seven we have to in all the areas to spread out the pressure we should have consistent seasons for coho consistent opening areas for coho um, it would spread out the pressure and not create this uh, jam like it Sometimes this isn't area 10 because it's non-selective. And possession bar was closed last. Well, it was mark selective for possession bar area 9. And then 8-2, the southern part, was one fish bag limit, non-selective. So everybody was down in 10 pretty much. And nobody likes to combat fish if... The department and the managers would please open up for coho areas with bigger bag limits up to two and lessen the pressure and it makes the fishery enjoyable throughout Puget Sound and the Straits enjoyable for everybody where we're not crowded in like a bunch of sardines. Thank you. Um, area nine, uh, the last week of September is open for non-selective fishery currently in the model and a two is a two fish back limit. It is non-selective. Okay. And 10 is non-selective. Then 10 is non-selective. Okay. So I, I have trouble understanding the model and not having area nine be consistent with Eight, two, and ten. Well, it really boils down to <clears throat> the model and the tag recoveries that are in the model and what that exploitation is on the natural stocks that's in Area 9. Area 9 is one of our biggest mixed stock areas throughout Puget Sound, right? So you're impacting 
almost all the the natural coho stocks in area nine where that's not necessarily the case for area 10 or area 8-2 uh, where they may see more of the localized natural populations you know i don't think there's a whole lot of hood canal fish for instance in in area 8-2 but there is in nine and so as we're thinking about these seasons we really have to be able to craft them in a way that we're not over exploiting one natural population or another we're trying to stay within all of those conservation constraints and and do our best uh, to provide the most robust opportunity we can within those constraints well here's a, a suggestion for area nine and and i've heard it in past years where for coho make it into a, a northern and southern area um i can understand the the coho coming around the corner at Point Wilson into Area Nine from from six, um, those you know I can see where the Hood Canal stocks would be coming in for those. But correct me if I'm wrong. If we're if we're drawing a line from Foulweather Bluff to Double Bluff, I mean, considering that Area Nine South for coho, would a lot of those fish not be Hood Canal stocks? Well, we see hood canal stocks in as far south as 10 and 11 and maybe even into area 13. I don't know. I'd have to look at the tag recovery. So it, it's not like these fish uh, uh, operate through geographic boundaries that, that we've put on a map. Uh, they're kind of just swimming wherever the, the feed is or, or wherever they feel like they're drawn to. So. Is there another question? Uh, so I see the Snohomish, we're looking at a September 21st start date below Lincoln Street. Is there any room to potentially open from the Forks to Lincoln Street on the 21st or bank angling only? Thanks for the suggestion, Gabe. I'm, I'm sure it's something that we can look at. I would think it would be minimal Chinook impacts up there if it was bank angling only, and there's a lot of good bank spots for people. Thanks. We have a question online to go to uh, from Brandon. Brandon, go ahead. On the coho seasons, are we just planning on um, for like Marine Area 5 and 6 um, being done on September 30th? Or are we talking a little bit about any October fishing? Yeah. I bring so, so there's two weeks of um, non-selected fisheries in um, five and six October, the first two weeks of October, and also the last week of September is non-selective with the one fish bag. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good to hear you, Brandon. Thank you. Good to hear you too. Todd, did I miss if this is based off of any particular ocean package? It's based off the mid mid ocean. Mid ocean. Does that Snohomish number change much if it goes to the low? Not by much, I don't think. It doesn't bring us under. Okay. Well, we kind of live in a world where not by much matters. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we have room to work with that. Okay. Right? Yeah. Sure. How do the, is there any Chinook impacts that factor into going to non-selective in the month of September for a two-fish bag limit for Area 7? No? Derek, I see you shaking your head. No. 
No, in terms of in terms of Chinook impacts, I think we would model it the same. Great. That's it for now. Thank you. Hello, Brett Barkell. Uh, I was wondering a uh, couple simple questions. I'm assuming that the uh, changes that we that were proposed for Chinook won't have much impact on Snohomish Coho. Am I correcting in thinking that? I I don't think so. Um, don't think so. And maybe I'd look to Ty to answer questions about Coho. A lot of the changes that we're, we would potentially be making to Chinook would potentially result in shorter Chinook seasons. Um, I think in a lot of those scenarios, there would be um, extra impacts built in for coho non-retention in case those seasons closed early with reduced quotas. So I don't think that from a Chinook perspective, I, I, I think we would remain open for coho in most scenarios. We'd have to look kind of at what was exactly going into the modeling in terms of non-retention. So I don't think it should impact Ty's numbers, but I just want to check and make sure. Oh, I, I, I just, I'm guessing you're probably not as familiar with the in-river fishery, but there's a, a, a gap there between the coho season and the Chinook season. I don't think there would be overlap as far as impacts and, and what we'd be considering there. Thanks, Mark. Okay, just a, a second question real quick. Um, the northern fisheries, I'm I'm curious what uh, how much of a swing there could potentially be depending on what they're doing. From a Chinook perspective on, uh, I guess we've already got coho in there. So from a Chinook perspective, uh, adding in the northern fisheries and, and forecasts, we won't have that information available. It's supposed to be coming um, out Thursday. Um, I don't want to say anything concrete until that information is finalized. Uh, in some years, we can see uh, a swing uh, in one way or the other. One stock that it particularly affects for Chinook is lower Columbia natural toolies, so more out on the ocean. But it can affect our Puget Sound stocks as well. We can see the southern U.S. or the total exploitation rates change by a little bit. Um, from the preliminary looks I'm t I've taken, uh, it seems like uh, the, the fisheries are likely to be relatively similar to last year. I don't anticipate any big changes. I do anticipate that maybe the southern U.S. will swing by a few tenths of a percentage point, one way or the other. But, uh, but I, I don't, I don't anticipate any huge changes from from that modeling process. Canadian uh, forecasts and fisheries are in this model for coho. Yeah. I want to make sure um, the in-river fisheries, um, I know they do in-season adjustments. I want to make sure we didn't get overlooked uh, late season when it's not affecting the saltwater guys at all. Our November, December time frame, we still get a lot of beautiful coho coming in. Um, and I want to make sure it was addressed. Uh, if we do have an overabundance that we get extensions into the late season. I want to put that on record. Thanks for that. Uh, and I won't say too much other than uh, Kirsten, uh, along with the, the tribal co-managers, uh, have worked on an in-season update model uh, for Snohomish Coho. Um, it didn't perform as well last year as it had in the in the previous couple years. Uh, you know, essentially it overpredicted what we expected to return uh, on that in-season update. <clears throat> That's, that's a good thing to happen when we're going through these models because it, it helps ground truth things a little bit and make sure that, you know, we're, we're being uh, cautious about how much we uh, put into any one tool we use for evaluation. So uh, <clears throat> it is something that we use as a tool uh, in those in-season discussions. Uh, you know, we have for a number of years since 2015, we have... Uh, regular check-ins uh, with the uh, Stiligwamish and Snohomish co-managers in season, particularly about coho. Um, and uh, we take in lots of different fishery information from the straits on in 
And uh, I believe uh, at least in the past couple of years, we've gotten at least one opportunity where we were able to extend the season based on what we were seeing in fisheries and on the return. So thanks for the suggestion. It's, it's you know, uh, we do have those opportunities to expand if we're seeing the right signals uh, through fisheries and through, you know, some of our tools that we use for that, that in-season update assessment. Thank you. Do we have any uh, coho or Kirsten during our Chinook openers in Area Seven that we get? Is is that forecasted to have a fish limit? Uh, one of which can be a a mark selected coho, like years past, or or is the coho season strictly going to only begin in August? So while the Chinook fishery is ongoing. Will there be an opportunity for coho during that? Yeah, yeah, there there has been. I was trying to remember it in my head what, what we had in the past. And and yes, there there is coho retention that's allowed then. Um, I think we typically don't see a ton of coho at that time period. So I think it, it's kind of been not a huge issue. But yes, there is re coho retention built into that time period starting on the same day that the Chinook opener happened. Right. And so, yeah, so it, and it would only, just to clarify, so it would only be open while Chinook are open yeah that's typically until how, that's until the season starts until right? the, yep. the august 1st when the, right. the coho season coho directed season because we have the chinook directed season with coho retention allowed and then the coho directed season would would open up on August. correct yeah. perfect thanks for clarifying yep. now when we look at the changes that we have proposed here ty this does not change what that august fishery is scheduled to do in area seven area seven is scheduled to do a mark selective fishery but it will be a two fish bag limit in the month of august this is strictly the additions you have here are strictly just to make amendments to september correct that is correct awesome thank you so uh, looking at area 10, or I'm sorry, area 9, um, it's set to close, goes through September 30th with non-selective 924 to 930, one coho. Is there any thought to open, keep that open through October um, and also add a chum I know we might be getting to chum later, but um, sticking with coho, I just remember catching a lot of nice coho in Area 9 in October. They're still coming. Just wondering if that's a possibility. And also to maybe add add chum because they start coming in and they're, they're an awful lot of fun to, to chase and, and catch from point no point down to Kingston in area nine in in uh, in October into the middle of uh, November. I don't know if I don't think there's a lot of Im impact and recreational numbers on Chum. I know there's a a net fishery on that side of the sound during that time. I don't think we would impact, but it's kind of nice to go out and have the opportunity to to catch a chum and put it on the smoker and you know they're they're just really fun so it'd be great if you could consider those two thank you i could speak to the coho and there is an option in here for eight days of fishing uh two fish non-selected bag in october and you can see that it, it's it's really kind of heavy on hood canal wilds um and a little bit in the home so they, they catch a lot of fish in, in area nine. If I could, if I could add to that, last year we were looking at that October piece for coho in marine area nine uh, in October, and uh, it was quite expensive on Chinook impacts, particularly on Snohomish Chinook as well in terms of non-retention encounters needed. 
Uh, it's a combination of both mature and immature. Both go into the exploitation repopulation. And maybe I'll jump in on the chum piece. <clears throat> Specifically, uh, our, our northern sound area rivers, uh, the S rivers, as, as I like to refer to them, so Skagit, Stillaguamish, and Snohomish, uh, have all had, uh, uh, I, I guess at this point, kind of long-term depressed uh, chum returns, uh, low productivity on those chum populations. Uh, that combined with uh, some of the recent year low productivity of the South Sound natural chum populations, we would be uh, extremely reluctant to offer any kind of, you know, understanding that the recreational impact is very low. Uh, I think we would be really reluctant to offer chum opportunity in Area 9, um, especially in that October time period. Since it's low, uh, low returns on chum, does that mean that there's not going to be any directed commercial fishing? No, we have an apple uh, cove test fishery that happens in area nine. Uh, that's that's part of our modeling and our assessment of those returning chum. The The commercial fisheries happen in, in marine areas 10 and 11, uh, and then also in the Hood Canal in, in 12 and 12B. Well, if there's low returns in depressed gum stocks, then why are why is there still commercial fishing on those stocks? Well, because the co-managers have developed objectives, and in fact, the department has put uh, a, a really significant uh, uh, investment in recent years in evaluating of those commercial fisheries. Um, I think if you look at the fish and wildlife policy. Uh, chum are a commercial priority, and so we prioritize commercial fisheries over regulate uh, re recreational fisheries for those opportunities. That doesn't seem right to me, but I'm a commercial fit, or I'm not Freudian slip. I'm a recreational fisherman, so that doesn't make sense to me. But I guess that's just the way it is. I. Pat here, um, chum, former chum fishery manager. Um, um, Mark, I just, I thought a, a few clarifying comments. I, at least I think it's clarifying. Correct me if I'm wrong. The area nine, there is no non-Indian commercial fishery in area nine. So to your point, it's, it, I mean, even the chum priority, it's not relevant to this question. There just is no commercial fishery in Area 9. So there isn't a conflict in, I don't know, an ethical one or a management one. It's uh, um, there. there is, you know, the state could consider having a chum-directed fishery, but why? It's open for coho. You can catch a, um, in, in October it's closed. So, so it's not open at all for either sport fishing for salmon or for commercial fishing for salmon. Just this test fishery occurs just at the bottom there of Area 9 at Apple Cove, and it's been going on for years, and it's a really good identifier of what the strength of the South Sound and Mid Sound chum runs is. So it's a really good thing. And and I also want to uh, compliment the department in in uh, supporting a uh, opportunity for though though it may be considered a coho opportunity, it is open for chum retention. It's going to be really small in that first part of November, as it is proposed at least now, and maybe will get adopted this year. So, so there's a, a fairness and uh, there's not exclusivity um, for commercial with CHUM. There's not, a, you know, the reverse of it is often true. There's 
Chinook and Coho in Puget Sound, but there's really no commercial fishing for non-Indian on those species. So there's a, an overall balance. It's a bigger story than I think was just discussed. So just adding those comments. Thanks. And thanks, Pat. I guess I, I just want to be really clear. There is a small commercial fishery uh, from the tribes that does take place, not every year, uh, but it does occur in Area 9, but it's in that area of Area 9 that's above the Hood Canal Bridge uh, and, you know, kind of below the, the, the main area of Area 9 um, that, that we're talking about here. So, um, again, they usually have catch caps uh, within that fishery that's, that's negotiated uh, amongst the co-managers. The co um, but I just I want to make sure that I didn't want to come out and say there is no fishing because there is a, a tiny little bit in that one part of area. So thank you. We have a question online from Stanley. Stanley, go ahead. Okay. You can hear me, I hope. Um, yeah, we got you. Last year with the uh, the Area 10 uh, shift to one coho limit late because of too many coho early, what is the department doing to preclude that? Because that's when the majority of the adult coho are in Area 10. And uh, what are they going to do? How are we going to keep that from happening this year? Well, uh, I think it's fair to say every year is different. The department chose uh, to reduce the daily limit for coho in Area 10 last year, uh, primarily due to uh, concerns that we heard about impacts on some natural stocks. Last year, uh, folks may remember that... Um, uh, Skagit coho, Skagit natural coho were one of our constraining stocks. Um, if you look at the modeling, particularly in area June, but also in, in July, uh, August, and September, there's a, a large amount of Skagit coho that can be found in the area 10 fishery in the model. So uh, we chose to, to take a precautionary approach. And I think uh, from the, the monitoring and evaluation that we did of the area 10 fisheries last year, those coho catches that we predicted preseason versus what we estimated in season were, were pretty incredible. Uh, we saw, I think, uh, over 30,000 coho harvested uh, between July and September last year in Area 10, which is a, a pretty significant number. So we chose to be uh, precautionary for a certain period of time, uh, and we did reopen it for two coho later in September. So I, I can't sit here and say that it won't happen again, um, you know, I think we're just trying to be uh, cognizant of, of some of the fisheries impacts. Again, as Kirsten talked about at the beginning of our presentation today, uh, we've seen some significant effort shifts around some of our fisheries and these and, and the popularity and efficiency of the, the recreational fleet. So, uh, you know, us trying to be uh, cognizant of those impacts and, and cognizant of our, our obligations under conservation. So, so nothing new in, in, in data collection or whatever to get ahead of the game and not wait till it's over <laughs> to do that? Or, I mean, I guess what, that's, what I, that's what I'm after. I guess I'm not understanding what your question is. I mean, well, we, we... If, if, if we're exceeding our, our, our quota early, that means we're probably exceeding our quota based on, on, uh, non-adult fish. That that's my assumption. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, and and I prefer to have adult fish than three-pound fish. Uh, so you know, currently uh, we don't have coho quotas as part of our management paradigm. So uh, you know, it, it's not a matter of of reaching a certain catch level. We do have what the modeling tells us as far as expected catch. And that's really what we're looking at uh, in season is what we're seeing in the fishery versus what the expected catch was preseason. Uh, and we're also, you know, uh, considering, as I said, the other factors uh, around what stocks are, are more depressed in any one year or the next. Um, the, you know, I, I understand what you're saying about re adult returns uh, versus, you know, uh, you know, more of the resident fish that we see in that June and July time period, uh, at least in the recent past. Um, 
So uh, I think uh, a precautionary approach could be that you have uh, less of a daily limit early in the season and more later. But again, uh, each of those time steps in the coho model are by month, right? So uh, as you're you're trying to craft these things, um, I think it, it we're going to keep it at two fish uh, in the model, you know, for this year and going forward. And I think we're just going to take that uh, approach on a year-to-year -year basis as we see how the fishery ends up, uh, you know, um, coming to fruition in season and what those catch rates are like. Thank you. Along the same vein as the gentleman that just hung up or just, just got offline, um, you were talking about a huge effort shift on coho, and you mentioned July through September. Did you mean to say June through September? Because I believe we've seen a tremendous increase in popularity in that June resident coho fishery, and as a follow-on, as we've seen this increase in effort across coho, what type of expense has, has there been an impact on the number of Chinook impacts we've had to allocate to preserve that fisher? I'm looking at the seasons, June through September, can we save some Chinook impacts, especially for the areas of concern, by perhaps truncating that early, that, that June season by a few weeks? Thank you. So I'll let Derek answer, answer the modeling part of that in a minute. Um, I didn't misspeak because we actually do see uh, that effort continue from June into July. And, and really that's, uh, folks are, are, are participating in that uh, opportunity in Area 10 before Chinook opens, uh, and they're, they're going out and seeing what they can get for coho uh, while they're waiting to get out on the water for Chinook as well. So, and Derek, I, do you want to address the, the Chinook impacts? Yeah, so one thing that we did notice is that um, last year when we saw that higher um, uh, retention of coho in that June time period, there was an associated higher encounters of Chinook. It was, last year was the highest encounters we've ever seen in June for Chinook during that coho-based fishery. Uh, and what we had in the preseason modeling, we, we exceeded it by kind of uh, uh, a few times over. So uh, this year I wanted to take a little bit more precautionary approach. And when I was preparing the modeling for, for that fishery, uh, we have about 2,500 Chinook non-retention encounters which is essentially what we saw last year in that fishery. I'm using last year as a conservative estimate for what we might use this year. Uh, I did look at what the impact of that was on stocks of concern, and it didn't seem like it had a strong effect on the stocks of concern. Correct, encounters. I guess I have a little bit of a chicken and egg question. Are we seeing increasing effort on those co in the summer because people just suddenly discovered it and become interested in it, or there's a hell of a lot more fish? But my experience in the last 25 years is I think there's a lot more fish. For some reason, you know, those resident coho, which will spawn this this fall, so they're, they're we can think of them as adult fish rather than sub-adult fish, but they're maturing fish. Seems like there's a lot more of them. And you know, and, and fishermen given the opportunity, especially, um, they go they go fish for them. I think I remember in 2019 that June fishery, I think it was the first year we fished in June, caught 11 percent of all the coho caught in Puget Sound that year. So it's it's it can be a pretty uh, impressive harvest of coho. I mean, who would have thought in June we could catch over 10 percent of the the total run to Puget Sound? Well, Kurt, I mean, you were working for the department in the mid '90s when I started doing charters in 1995, and and you know we didn't have the kind of effort that we have now, and um, 
we didn't have the kind of closures in adjacent areas. So um, we had incredible coho hatchery production in the mid 90s and the resident coho fishing was absolutely out of this world in Marine Area 10 in 1995, six, seven, eight, and nine. It was, it was triple as good as it was last summer we didn't have the harvest numbers that we broke records of because we didn't have the participation. It was basically a charter boat fishery. There were a handful of recreational boats out there fishing. Um, but um, somebody in here probably knows that the hatchery production for Coho and Puget Sound was significantly higher in the mid nineties than it is right now. And there was phenomenal Coho fishing. I, I think what we're seeing is yes, the, the word's gotten out that it's a good, good fishery and then we have adjacent areas closed. That's my perspective on that uh, answer to your question as a participation in this. Uh, I personally think it's an increase in effort every year. So, yeah, it, you could, it, it seemed to got popularized in 2017, 2018. Um, yeah. uh, I, I noticed every option to change on this here is all saltwater affiliated. Um, I I'm skeptic that this is preparing for some major adjustments to freshwater fisheries to meet that Snohomish number. Or can you present a scenario with your options here, Ty, that do get that 1.34% accommodated for? Yeah. Um, could make a couple mark selective fisheries in here. Uh yeah, I think it would be helpful just for us to have an idea so there's not some crazy culture shock here. Yeah. Um, so we have something that's a little bit more realistic of what we might look at in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that all the changes are going to come in Puget Sound as being presented here. Okay. I think we'll probably see some movement on the tribal side and some movement maybe in river. Oh, so you, you anticipate some co-manager adjustments to help with that, meeting that 40% number? I can't guarantee that. Sure. Um, I can jump in, Ty. So, Alex, uh, we've already had uh, uh, several discussions with our uh, uh, Snohomish co-managers, uh, Tulalip Tribe, uh, about coho fisheries this year. Um, I think, uh, again, I don't want to get over my skis here, but I do believe that there's going to be adjustments on both the, the non-treaty and the, the tribal side uh, on fisheries adjustments to meet that objective. I, I don't believe as I'm sitting in front of you today that it's all going to come out of the, the, the non-tribal side uh, of that equation. That's great news, Mark. Um, so it's safe to say that as far as the freshwater side of things. For our, bot or our coach's birthday, no one Um, where I was going, I, just, I would like to make sure or just hear some form of acknowledgement or indication on what changes we'll see, whether it's freshwater or salt to accommodate that Snohomish number. Thanks. Well, you know the modeling better than I do. I guess, Alex, what what I would see is it's really, you know, once we see where the ocean numbers are at, and as we said, the ocean's not going to contribute very much, uh, I think that's where, you know, we would look at, at, you know, what's left on the exploitation rate and try to find some sort of uh, agreement with the co-managers about what that looks like. So for us, we could, you know, maybe cut a week out of the river uh, or, you know, move the river opening date later um, and, and, you know, maybe make an adjustment by a few days or a week in the marine area, whether that's a two or nine or, or another area that has Snohomish impacts and, and try to find some adjustment and balance that way is how I'm thinking about it. Okay. Okay. I, I just, I may not be the most avid river fisherman, but I know that they've taken a lot of hits 
especially with with what's going on with the Snohomish system in the last year specifically. So, um, well, part of the uh, calculation in the river too is just the earlier we are in the coho fishery, the more Chinook impacts we're going to have as well. So I that's understand. factoring into to you know where we may consider landing on that that recreational season as well. Thanks, Mark. So the uh, questions don't have to be coho related. Uh, you know, we're, um, we're, we're in here talking about all the fisheries, so. I'm gonna upset the apple cart. Now, you know, we've been talking about shortage. Why aren't we talking about building hatcheries and supplying the hatcheries? And you said, you said one time about a surplus of Chinook. There's no such thing as a damn surplus on a fish if you're a sportsman. Now, what are we getting? What can we do about that? Well, I think if you look at our hatchery escapement reports, there is a thing called surplus. Uh, there's quite a few fish that get surplused in a number of our hatcheries. Why aren't you putting them? Down, you know. Well, I mean, the reality of it is hook and line fishing is an inefficient way to remove salmon out of the system. Uh, you know, it's just not a very efficient bottom, gear for. Bottom out. I mean, that's, and we need bigger. What it is, a surplus is you don't have a big enough supply or hatchery that you can take care of, correct? Well, you're, you're right. A lot of our hatchery capacity is limited now. And again, I'm going to get over my sneeze here really quick. Yeah, well, um, but I think our hatchery capacity we're we're at we're at max capacity right now as far as you know uh, you know the number of ponds or incubation or any of the things that go into raising fish. I I think we're maxed out at this point. What about building more hatcheries? Now there was a politician in, in uh, Snohomish that he raised millions of dollars for hatchery deals. Uh, I don't know whatever became of the money, but. You know, you don't have anything to say with that about that. But it's just well, the the realities are is uh, I think anytime we're thinking about hatchery expansion, it gets into water rights conversations, and those water rights are really valuable. And I'm not sure that that there's there's um, considering all the needs uh, around water usage around the state. Uh, I, I you know. <laughs> That that's a decision and 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 kind of a conversation above my level within the department, uh, but I I do think that's one of the major limiting factors to any kind of hatchery expansion is is what those water rights are in any given system, they just aren't there. Aren't there a few hatcheries that uh, in years past was efficient and then now they've closed them down and what what's the chance of uh, opening them up, rebuilding them, repairing them? So maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll jump in here. Thanks for the question. I think it's important to understand that just like our fisheries are limited by the Endangered Species Act, so is our hatchery production. And since 2017, between the Columbia River and Puget Sound, in terms of hatchery production, as a result of the governor's SRKW initiative, and we had some directives uh, um, uh, from our commission, we've increased hatchery production across Chum, Coho, and Chinook to the tune of about 22 million. I'll probably get that, that number wrong, but it's right around 22, 23 million fish. But the reality is we just can't go around building hatcheries and operating hatcheries the way we did 30, 40, even 20 years ago. Um, you've probably uh, seen in the news, uh, you know, we're constantly um, being uh, uh, litigated against for our hatchery production. Right now in the lower Columbia River, there's a, a third party 60 day notice that was uh, filed on hatchery production in the in the in the Col lower Columbia River. So again, similar to my response to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we got federal regulations that we are are obligated to comply with. Now that said, <clears throat> you know, I got some feedback at the break that I I look a little grumpy when I'm sitting up here. Um, it was from your partner right there, so I I appreciate that, and it's, and I'm not grumpy because I'm sitting here in this room with you all. There's a ton of work that's done um, by the folks at this table and a lot of work in the background done by our, our regional staff. I'm talking hours and hours and hours of work. And 
And despite what some people may think, um, we don't we don't sit up at night or during the day trying to figure out ways to to close down fisheries, right? The grumpiness that that I feel is associated with all of the work that's being done by our staff, by the co-managers, by you all, by the advisors to help us frame up these fisheries. It's frustrating, um, um, despite all that hard work, that we're talking about the fisheries that we're talking about. Now, I'm proud of the work that staff are doing, don't get me wrong, but we've got limitations in terms of uh, uh, the fisheries we can, we can uh, promulgate for you all and for us. We're fishers too. Um, so man, I wish we were in area seven a lot more. I wish we could, you know, I wish we could do a lot more than we're doing on the fishery side as well as the hatchery side. But the reality of it is, is we've got federal obligations that we need to comply with and we are limited by what we can do with our hatcheries. Those 22 million fish that I mentioned, a good number of those fish are still under review by NOAA fisheries. You know, we think we're going to get coverage for them. But with that coverage, you're going to come biological opinions and unfunded mandates in terms of the terms and conditions, additional weirs, additional monitoring. All of those different things are going to be factors in, in what we can do in the future with, with hatchery production. Now, we haven't, I mean, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll pass the mic, you know, you asked about building new hatcheries. Um, we've looked at a couple of areas, and I mean, it's on our minds, but they have to be in the right places. We have to have the water right, and we have to be confident that that those hatcheries and the production associated with those hatcheries are going to be compliant with the Endangered Species Act. So, so we're looking at all of those things, but man, everywhere we look, um, and I, I hope this doesn't come across as an excuse, but everywhere we look, whether we're talking about hatchery production, whether we're talking about fisheries opportunities, there are hurdles that we have to navigate. So I hope you can appreciate that, and uh, I, I really appreciate your question. Oh, yeah, I'm, I appreciate it. But now this would just make these guys' jobs easier. <laughs> and I'm the type of guy, I, I won't ask permission. I want to ask forgiveness. Fair enough. Thank you, Asset. Seems like we moved off from Cove, so I'm going to make my game fish pitch once again. Um, on the Stoguamish, looks like it's the Schnook's not going to be the, the dramatic limiter it has been in the past, so we should have a, a fish or two to, to be used in for in river fisheries. And, and I'm full in support of the Cove fishery. But we made changes in the, the game fish fishery in the North Fork of the Stille and moved down river to get away from the Schnook's. They monitored last year, and I don't know that we encountered any Schnook's while we were targeting the Sea Run Cutthroat down there. If we did, it was very, very low encounter rates. I see no reason with the kinds of uh, probable level impacts we'll have for an in-river fisheries that we can't see at least the equivalent of what we had in 2023 and, you know, and, and move forward with the monitoring so we can make informed decisions for the future. Um, personally, I always, of course, would like to see a little bit more, but then everybody in this room would like to see some more. more. Your guys' job means that, you know, at any one time, if less than half of us are pissed at you, you're winning. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. And maybe just to respond to that quickly, as we move down the line and as some of those Stiligwamish uh, impacts potentially free up, we're going to be looking at uh, other options like in-river uh, or that. Uh, we have to have those discussions, those regional discussions, of course, um, but that's one of the things that we have been looking at. Looks like we have another hand online from Stanley. Stanley, go ahead. Okay, got me. Okay, I'm going to transition to Duwamish Green River. Um, Non-pink years. We tend to open September 1st. Pink years, we open August 20th. And, uh, and I know it's to be able to access those earlier arriving pinks. But the, what happens is, is that we get uh, Chinook in the system in that in that earlier opener that are uh, they they have sea lice on them. Later in the year they don't have sea lice on them. So it just talks about the quality of the fish. And I enjoy the Chinook. I'm not a big pink fisher person. I'd like to propose that we open a standard opening of August 20th on the Green Duwamish.
Thanks for that. We'll uh, we'll take a look at it and see if it's something that we can consider this year. Hi, my name's Bill. I'm new to this thing. Um, I just have one question. Does the state uh, monitor the sound? Is the sound actually uh, healthy enough to support all these fish that you're trying to shove through this tiny channel into all these other rivers? Do, how often is that considered as part of the problem that, you know, uh, the habitat, you know, kelp beds, there's stuff that was there years, 50 years ago is not there. Um, is the state, does this enter into any part of your uh, matrix as to what we can keep and what we can't, or what we can fish for and what we can't? Is that any, does that have any bearing on all of this? Well, there's a certain amount of uh, environmental uh, information that we try to incorporate into our forecasts each year. Uh, you know, uh, things that, have, that, that uh, would or may affect survival um, in any given year. Um, as far as, you know, taking a, a global look at the health of Puget Sound and, um, and, and how that relates to fisheries opportunities and, and impacts, you know, uh, not necessarily something that that we're <clears throat> wrapping our heads around in, in, in any given point in the year. Uh, there are uh, other entities that, that take a more global, holistic uh, look at uh, the, the health of Puget Sound. And um, I think, uh, you know, there, there's maybe even the, the Salmon Recovery Office puts out a, a report on kind of the, the state of salmon and, and other things in Puget Sound and talks about the the, some of the key health indicators in Puget Sound. Um, I, I'm kind of dancing around your question there because I'm not quite sure how to answer it, but um, I, I think we try to try, try to incorporate as much information as we can uh, to the best of our ability in, in our decision making. Um, anything you want to add? I was just going to kind of say that, you know, while the, the fisheries management group that you see in this room right now doesn't necessarily do the direct water quality monitoring or things like that, there is a pretty extensive amount of that going on around the state from other agencies, um, both within WWW uh, through the Habitat Program and also through uh, groups like Ecology. Uh, so while we in this room are not doing that, it, there is work being done there in that realm. We have a hand online from Zach. Zachary, go ahead. Hey guys, sorry, I know I'm pretty pretty late to the ball here, but just wanted to, uh, and maybe got addressed earlier. Just wanted to speak strongly in favor of that Marine Area Eleven uh, Chinook quota increase um, for June. I know that uh, that doesn't really cost us much for the Snohomish, and that has the I think the secondary effect of helping with some of that. I know there's been, there was a discussion when I first got on here about the Marine Area 10 June resident coho um, and how, you know, that's gotten increasingly popular. And I think that if we are able to boost that Marine Area 11 uh, Chinook quota for June, I think that there'll be some significant effort shift uh, down there out of the, the coho fishery. Um, and that'll potentially sort of, you know, create the the, the positive effects where then there's fewer coho so that are caught in June. So we're not as worried about catching more, you know, more than is modeled. And I just think that that fishery has the, has the potential just to, to really help both, you know, give some more opportunity so that if things get closed down later in the season, people aren't feeling quite so much like, oh, the season got, you know, seasons are so short now, but also to help with that Marine Area 10 uh, resident coho. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary. We're definitely going to be taking a look at that option. Um, uh, it, it's one of those areas that I think could really use that quota, uh, that quota change, since we were only open for eight days last year. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, on a lot of our stocks of concern, it's relatively low impact. So we'll probably circle up with some regional discussions on that piece. Uh, we haven't talked in any detail too much on the Bellingham Bay Terminal Fishery. I know Tom had mentioned a, uh, an amendment to that opening date. I would second that opening date to August 1st if that's possible. I know the department might have some concern with um, 
commercial and recreational fisheries uh, overlapping. I don't see that being an issue. It's a large enough area. Um, I was curious if someone was still here that could speak on exactly what our surplus came back to the Samus River hatchery last year. If they don't have that, what was the year before that? Last year, I think, uh, looking at the escapement report, it was about 10,000 uh, that was surplused out of Samish. We also saw a lot of uh, uh, die-off in the river below the hatchery. Um, so that's probably not a, a, a complete uh, accurate sure. Sure. number from last year. But we have seen, you know, since we, we increased production for SRKW, we have seen some, some uh, bigger returns which, uh, to yeah, the Samish. Which we'll see continue. Yep. specifically this year and next year as well as those fish are more mature coming back um which would be a good reason for why we talk about opening up bellingham bay to august 1st that's another two weeks of opportunity for us to target the fish when we're dealing with surplus numbers um i'll let you you have some smart again i i think uh the reason for that start date at least historically has been around you know uh concern for impacts on nooksack springs you know, uh, uh, basically allowing all those fish to clear the marine area prior to uh, to us putting gear in the water. I don't have a specific remembrance about the commercial recreational splits. Okay. I have a, a feeling that it was really just a an artifact of the past. And, you know, when we were fishing wide open in Area 7 uh, in the summer and, you know, people weren't necessarily participating as, as heavily in, in sure. recreational opportunities in the Bay. Uh, okay. Uh, that brings me to a question, Mark, when you talk about giving it two more weeks for the Nooksack. So, so you're saying you don't know of a commercial fishery that's occurring in, in those first two weeks of August? No, it's, I mean, the, the, the fisheries are on the books. Okay. So we're not concerned about Nooksack impacts on those commercial fisheries. Well, remember uh, different gears, they impact those fish at different rates and, and that's all based on tag recoveries. So, um, I don't, Derek could tell you what the tag recoveries are on Nooksack Springs between, you know, tribal commercial, state commercial, and, and recreational. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but all the different gears impact those fish at different rates. I would imagine so. How is the state re retrieving any CWTs on commercially caught fish? Or, or is that? We have sampling staff at the fish buyers when they land those fish. We do, uh, you know, CWT and biological sampling of those fish. Okay, great. Um, so for, further on the Bellingham Bay stuff, Mark, we talked about last year a, a suggestion to broadening what that terminal area looks like. And, and I know you presented some obstacles that you would encounter if you wanted to expand that region to include Bellingham Channel. Um, you know, we fish that terminal area and we're looking at a half a mile to maybe a mile to get to Bellingham Bay Terminal, the, excuse me, the Bellingham Channel area. So we're worried about two weeks of allowing fish to move through, but we're not worried about a half a mile into an area. So a half a mile can make a difference on us making an impact on a stock, but two weeks does as well. I just, it, it doesn't seem exactly very accurate or you might, you guys might be able to make more sense of it than I can. Well, I'm not really sure what your question is. I mean, what is the what is the possibilities of us extending the Bellingham Bay Terminal to include Bellingham Channel? Well, I think as we explained last year, changing geographic boundaries also complicates uh, how we uh, uh, evaluate tag recoveries, right? So those are not by a specific, you know, uh, lat long in Area Seven or Bellingham Bay. It's through a general Area Seven tag recovery or a general Bellingham Bay tag recovery. And when you start adjusting those boundaries, you know, you're basically compromising what the model's telling you because uh, the, the um, assumptions you made uh, when you put those things in the model and what those tags represent are no longer valid when you start moving lines in the water. Okay. Uh, lastly would be then, are we going to, if we're worried about Nooksack Springs to, um, well, not lastly, but we're worried about Nooksack Springs or Nooksack fish in general. Uh, are we going to enhance our sampling of the areas that are most accessible to the Bellingham Bay Terminal? 
Oh. Uh, are we going to have more sampling staff available to sample the fish on a non-selective fishery if we're worried about a wild stock fish? I can be even more specific. I, Please. We can, I've, Kirsten, I've had conversations about the lack of sampling crews that are present at the Twin Bridges launch site, for instance, which is one of the most closest proximities to that, that fishery. Uh, yet we're keeping staff on Friday Harbor to sample maybe a half a dozen boats when during this terminal fishery, you can go and see how many trailers are parked at the Twin Bridges launch. Yet the only thing we're sampling there is crab. When we have an ongoing non-selective fishery, I would think it's just as important for us to sample those, those salmon during that fishery as well. Well, uh, we can agree to disagree on that. Um, our sampling and monitoring programs, we're not doing an in-season catch estimate for Bellingham Bay. Our sampling and monitoring programs are meant to capture a catch and effort and encounter estimate for the greater portion of Area 7. So uh, currently, we're not doing an in-season catch estimate for Bellingham Bay. I'm not sure we need to at this point. But maybe you could convince me otherwise. So a fish in Bellingham Bay terminal fishery is not as important as a fish in the. In the I'm just area. telling you the way things are set up now. So that's why the sampling programs are geared the way they are, is because we're not trying to produce an estimate for Bellingham Bay. I'm not saying that it's not as important. I'm just saying we have a limited amount of resources. We can't stick sampling staff at every boat ramp, uh, public boat ramp in Puget Sound and capture every angler exiting the fisheries. That's just not a reality. I understand that. I just would expect us to be sampling at areas where there's a, a high a high rate of, of, of participants, especially in a fishery that's non-selective. Mark. We have a question online from Robert. Robert, go ahead. Uh, this Thank you. And this question, not really a question, but it's a recommendation for the green. Um, last year, uh, I talked with the biologist and I also made comments about opening on the 20th, not just on pink years, but every year. And I was encouraged that we were going to try to do that this year. So I was disappointed that that hadn't been put into the model. Um, I have had discussions with um, the biologist and I just want to advocate for doing that, not only this year, but moving forward. Um, the quality of the fish, the first 10 days when it opens on the 20th is significantly better. And, uh, you know, if there's any way to put that in on an ongoing basis, I just want to encourage that. Thank you. Wondering uh, on area eight two, I understand for code uh, finishes currently like at the 24th of September. Is there a possibility to go to the 1st of October as a beach fishery um, during those last seven, eight days there? Uh, maybe from for the ferry crosses down to the uh, area nine line. Interesting suggestion. Uh, I might look over to my friend Ty over there to see how easy that might be to uh, uh, evaluate as far as a, a modeling impact. Um, definitely something that we could consider. Uh, we 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 have done it in Area Nine before, and I think that that uh, that spot at, right at the uh, eight two nine boundary, uh, we did it there in a year or two, if I'm remembering correct. Yeah, I'd have to go and dig up what we did last year or not last year but 2017 we did that so thank thanks for the comment we'll we'll take a look at it and see if it's if if it fits into everything we're, we're trying to do we have a question from brandon online brandon go ahead yeah hey derek can you tell me what the uh chinook quota in marine area five is it's approximately 4,200 fish at the moment. In uh, Assuming that you meant the summertime, in the wintertime, yeah, it's summertime. about 1,400. Good. 
Um, so is there like marine areas five through 11? Is there any um, big increase in quotas? On Chinook? Relative to last year, in between marine areas five and 11, we kept the quotas uh, relatively similar, um, uh, the same in, in all areas with the exception of two places. So the two places where we changed were marine area five and nine. Uh, and what we did was we just used our methodology to update from the seasons from last year. So while the modeled seasons in marine area five and nine are the same, the quotas changed a little bit in terms of uh, in terms of marine area five. It went from about three thousand nine hundred to about forty two hundred fish, mm -hmm. uh, and then in marine area nine, it went from four thousand three hundred to around fifty six hundred fish. So a, a bigger increase in nine we saw, um, but um, but once again, because both of those both of, both of those areas had taken kind of a reduction near the end of the process last year, we wanted to try to bring those quotas more in line with what we think might be needed for a season that we had last year okay perfect um last question so like these coho fisheries um i know all of them are going to be a little bit different and stuff like so september let's just say marine area five is it got pretty big impacts on the chinook side of things uh for non-selective You mean in terms of if it changes from uh, mark selective to non-selective? Yeah, week by week. Uh, first, for, for Chinook, I don't typically model a difference, whether it's non-selective or mark selective, uh, in terms of Chinook non-retention encounters. Okay. Does it, um, a non-selective fishery in September, like for marine area 5-6, is that, the, so you're saying that, you, you there's no there's no impact or you you're just not putting it in the models well in terms of coho it would certainly make a difference uh in terms of chinook it could make a difference if we saw a different effort if, if we saw more people willing to participate in that fishery if it were non-selective versus mark selective right now i don't have any of that accounted for in the modeling at the moment at the moment Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So pretty new to the North of Falcon process. Um, one of the real frustrating things for, for all of us, in the room here in the last few years and i don't know when it when when did okay so there's there's mortality on shakers or and there's mortality on um natural or wild fish that are released but the new thing that's happened in the last few years is encounters and with the encounters that seems to be driving when our fisheries close down early. When did that encounter protocol or model or way of doing business start? And, and I think maybe just speaking for me, but I think in the future, we would need to, this group here sitting on this side, maybe you guys up there too, don't like it. I don't think anybody likes it because it shuts our fisheries down early and our opportunities. So when did it start where the encounter model start? And the second question is basically how can we get rid of it because it would keep our seasons open longer and everybody would be happier. Maybe not everybody, but I think most of us on the recreational side would be happier. I see some chuckles over there from Pat. So thanks for that. Well, I, I think there's, there's always been a concern around the, the number of fish that the, the recreational fleet encounters in, in any one fishery. Um, 
I can't sit here today and tell you exactly when it showed up on our on our radar for fisheries management considerations. Um, it's sometime probably within the last five to seven years, I would imagine. Uh, and, and it hasn't been the same or even consistent across areas uh, in given years. Uh, Pat talked about it. I also mentioned it earlier. There are other things that we consider uh, in, in terms of our management. For a long time, uh, and in a lot of areas, there are no encounter limits. It's really just about harvest uh, and, a, and a catch limit in the fishery. Uh, but there are some fisheries that consistently have uh, higher rates of encounters on, on sub-adults or even unmarked fish. Uh, I think most recently, the department, you know, as part of the, the, um, the mediated Chinook, fish, uh, Chinook management plan, uh, we have to be encounter, uh, accountable for all the, the, the encounters and associated mortalities with our fisheries as part of that plan. And that includes, you know, uh, those catch and release uh, uh, mortalities that are part of that. That's, that's why Pat, you know, has proposed a, a metric that we could consider that, that basically looks at, you know, a, a mortality index in any given area and really try to manage our fisheries uh, more towards, you know, assessing mortalities in season and trying to hold ourselves within those limits. Uh, I think folks are familiar with the, the plan. We've talked about it quite a bit. There is a payback provision in there uh, that uh, if we exceed our mortalities on still Aguamish in any, you know, one year, uh, we've agreed to reduce our fisheries in a subsequent year to pay those, those mortalities back that we were over. So I think we're really um, uh, extra cautious, I guess, is a good way to put it. We're, we're, we're vigilant about trying to stay within those because I don't want to be up here in any North of Falcon season uh, with a room full of angry people who I say, well, there's really no Chinook fishing this year and our coho fisheries are going to be limited because we went over on what we said we were going to do. And, and now we have to be off the water to account for that. I don't want that to happen. I want to at least try to, to be as consistent as we can with the seasons over time, you know, hang on to what we got, try to eke out as much opportunity as we can in, in any given area. So I understand the, the trepidation, uh, especially around the sublegal component, as we've talked about uh, a lot. Um, that's a hard thing to predict uh, in season in any given area, uh, what those might be. Um, but again, we're going to do our best to stay within those conservation constraints, maximize that opportunity where we can. Um, and, and, you know, we're always willing to think about and explore different ways of, of you know, staying within our, our management constraints, whether that's encounters or mortalities or some other thing that we're not necessarily considering. Other questions online or in the room? Haley, I don't know if you want to put the schedule back up on the screen. Um, for those who are interested, right down the road, starting on April 6th, uh, we'll be at the Westin in Seattle. Uh, most of the staff that are here will be there for the week. Um, as part of that process, for those who uh, may or may be thinking about attending or haven't been a part of that before, uh, Washington State does have a delegation uh, room that we meet in every morning. Uh, usually the first hour uh, from seven to eight in the morning is meant to uh, go over business from the council. So as part of that council process, there's, there's ground fish management, there's other things that are part of the, the Pacific council process besides salmon seasons. Salmon seasons really just take up March and April uh, of any given year as part of the council process. But uh, we will be meeting in there from seven to eight every morning. And then following that, and Kirsten's going to have to help me on a time, we do have a designated time that we'll be doing um, kind of uh, daily check-ins from there. So that'll be a, a hybrid meeting, much like we've been doing this spring, where uh, folks will be in the room uh, for who want to attend in person. And then we'll also have, uh, you know, the online capability to accept questions uh, and, and comments uh, through that uh, online. So 
staff will make themselves available uh, each morning through the process, I think starting on the 7th uh, was what we said, uh, just to uh, actually allow something to happen the first day. There probably won't be much to report on the first day. Um, so we'll be happy to, to start. I believe we're starting on the 7th uh, with those morning check-ins, and those will be all the way through the 11th. Um, as far as having the the, the recreational breakout uh, meeting separate from the morning delegation meeting. Um, any questions about that, I guess, as I'm talking to folks about that? So if you want to be there, you know, oftentimes there's opportunities there uh, to to grab staff in the hall and have so you know, get some additional questions answered or, you know, be able to look at, at some different modeling result that, that's up to date. We're going to do our best as we go through that week to, to keep the website updated. We've got uh, public affairs folks in the room and, and a big thanks for them to for working with us and, and keeping the website updated. Um, we'll commit to, to keep that going as we go through. Again, I'm going to encourage folks to go to our website and provide your comments in, in written form. Uh, that's We look at all those comments as we're going through this not just the people who are in the room here or online uh, providing us oral comments. We also consider the written comments as, as part of what we're trying to craft here. So I would encourage people to, to please submit those written comments as well. Um, with that, we do have uh, the Northeast McNary meeting tonight in Clarkston. And then, as I said, the, the PFMC meetings. Also, there is the Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor uh, breakout Zoom meeting tomorrow. Uh, that'll be in the evening from 6 to 8. And then following that on, I believe it's the 16th of April, uh, we will have uh, kind of the follow-up uh, um, uh, wrap-up meeting for Willapa Grace Harbor Fisheries as well. Any other questions online or in the room? Well, so as I was just talking about, the delegation meeting in the morning starts from 7 to 8. Well, but I think we posted it online when the meeting start time is. Can somebody confirm that? Thank you. 8.30 in the morning uh, from the 7th through the 11th. So that's when those, those Zoom meetings will start in the morning and for folks who want to be in person. Thank you for that question. Well, uh, if we don't say it enough, uh, we really appreciate folks' time being here today. Uh, you know, we may not always uh, provide you the answers you want to hear, but um, we we do appreciate your participation and your comments and your interests. Um, you know, as Kelly indicated early, earlier, uh, we're all Fisher people too. Um, we like to participate in these activities as well. And so uh, a lot of that is why we got into this and it's important to us. Uh, to keep this going to, to the best of our ability. So I really appreciate everybody's time and thoughts uh, and thank you for being here again and we look forward to seeing you soon. Travel safe, everybody. <laughs>